It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you. A couple of new first-timers. Ant Pruitt from Tech Republic, from the Code Breaker podcast, Ben Johnson, and, of course, Philip Elmer DeWitt. We're going to talk about what else, what Apple's going to do on Tuesday, what happened with Equifax. Oh, my gosh. And uh, we'll maybe mention a little bit about uh, Google, Android, Facebook, you know, the usual. It's time for Twit. Stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 631, recorded Sunday, September 10th, 2017. This one's for Jerry. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Qualcomm's Snapdragon Gigabit LTE. To learn more about fiber optic download speeds on a smartphone, go to snapdragon.com slash gigabit. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you looking to hire a tech professional? With ZipRecruiter, you can post to 100 plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy-to-use cloud accounting software used by over 10 million people. Try it free for 30 days at FreshBooks.com slash twit. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit the Tracker.com right now and enter the promo code TWIT to save 20% on any order. It's time for TWIT! This Week in Tech, the show where we get together with some of the smartest people in technology, the tech journalists par excellence, to talk about the week's tech news, and in this case, a little bit about what's ahead. Philip Elmer DeWitt is here, the senior elder statesman of Macintosh oh. journalism. I'm sorry, Phil. Getting I older to, every. I, I, got, I was. I was. This was. Uh, I was 68 this week. Wow. So I'm really getting old. Wow. Yeah. That is old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ped30 is his uh, blog. Ped30.com, and you can follow him on the Twitter. He's uh, Philip with one L. Philip Ped or Philip Ed. And uh, you're getting ready to go to the uh, Apple event on Tuesday, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. I want to welcome two new members to our Twit team, and I'm thrilled to have them. I've been fans for a long time of both. Ben Johnson is here. You, you've seen him uh, on Marketplace. He was the tech editor there. He's the creator of the Codebreaker podcast. And you may remember we were in hot pursuit of Codebreaker for the Webby. You got the People's Choice Award. By we shared it. A handful. It was of a votes. friendly, yeah. It was a friendly competition. <laughs> we loved it. Great loved to have. Great to have you, Ben. Why is Thanks your Twitter handle the fan. Brock Johnson? Who's this Brock Johnson that we talk of? Well, Bro Brock is my middle name, but you know, you're uh, for a long time my nickname was you know the Brock Johnson because of our next president, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Um, <laughs> oh, and, I get uh, it. <laughs> so you know, you're the B version of the Rock. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I get it. I get. It. Anyway, great to have you. We I ran into Ben at uh, the podcast movement, the big podcast podcast concert. I podcast conference. I'm sure they'll edit all that out and fix this in post. No, uh, uh, in Anaheim a few weeks ago, it was great to see you, and I thought we got to get yeah. you on the show. So I'm thrilled to have you. Thanks uh, for having me. Big a long time fan, first time caller. Thank you. So. And you'll yeah. have some announcements on Monday about the new thing because Molly Wood has taken over your role at Marketplace, which is great. Yes, yes, the oh. Molly Wood. We love her. I, I don't think that's her Twitter handle, but yeah. She, no, uh, her Twitter handle is it's perfect. Good. It's Molly Wood, which is perfect. <laughs> uh, you know, Hollywood with an M. Also thrilled to welcome Aunt Pruitt, who has been on, of course, TNT many times. He's a writer at uh, Tech Republic, uh, photographer, and a famous drone flyer. Aunt, great to have you. Hey, thank you, Mr. LaPorte. I, gotta, I really, really appreciate you having me. He's got a Clemson Tiger behind him, so I have a feeling we know who his, where his sympathies lie. It's great to have you. I also thank see a, a, a line drawing of somebody. Is that is that you or is that your dad? That is me. One of my great friends, readers, followers uh, over in Sweden, she drew that really as nice. well as another one on my wall. And it's That's just nice. um, she's so talented and it really warmed my heart to have someone send that to me. 
And I want to apologize for my voice for the listeners, because as you said, I'm a Tiger fan and I actually go to the games and I yell. So I'm going to sound a little bit like Barry White. But actually, I will try to soothe it with some whiskey. He, oh, good thinking. <laughs> People don't know. Ant is actually a tenor. <laughs> oh! So uh, I have to start, I'm sorry to say, with a, on a sad note, and I, I think uh, people are starting to just uh, learn the news. Uh, one of our longtime uh, friends, a uh, man who's been on Twitter 20 times, uh, we did two triangulations with him, the great science fiction author Jerry Pornell, passed away on Friday. Jerry went to Dragon Con in Atlanta, had a great time. His son Alex wrote uh, on uh, the Chaos Manor blog that uh, Jerry... You know, had a wonderful time at Dragon Con. He felt a little ill, maybe the flu or, or a cold, um, and uh, came home. And on Friday, he passed away quietly and without pain. And so we're very sorry to lose Jerry Pornell, uh, an inspiration for my career with his Chaos Manor column in Byte Magazine. The first, as best we can tell, first guy ever to write a novel on, his com on a computer. He wrote many great science fiction novels, including some with Larry Niven that are absolute classics like The Moat in God's Eye and uh, Lucifer's Hammer. And I want to thank our team who uh, jumped on this and pulled some clips from Jerry's many appearances on our shows. And we made a little uh, kind of tribute reel to uh, Jerry Pornell. Our guest today is somebody that I have, I've been a fan of literally for years, ever since his column in Byte Magazine. And he certainly influenced my career. Let's welcome Jerry Pornell. A lot of people couldn't figure out why in the world was I better known than anybody else in the computer business except maybe Dvorak. I wrote the Field and Stream column. Me and Joe went hunting. Well, me and old Zeke went computing. And that was the great secret I never told anybody. Great many, if not most, scientists were heavily influenced by sci-fi and focused their research on areas that science fiction inspired them to study, which is why, in so many ways, modern scientific advances parallel what you guys are writing about. When you get around to listening to the moat in God's eye, pay attention to the pocket computer. I wrote that in 1972, and an iPhone does most of what it says in there. But of course, we had to set it a long way away because even in, in 1972, nobody thought that I would live to see. Isn't it amazing? Most of the people in this world accept fruits of technology in about the same way as a kitten accepts milk when you pour it into a bowl for it. There was a common phrase in the robot industry, you never understand how smart a moron is until you try to program a robot. <laughs> it towards the end of the Soviet Union and Panovich, which was doing the handwriting recognition software for Microsoft. He said, my biggest problem is I don't have enough technical handwriting. Then I got my logbook out, you know, that's the technical handwriting that was the standard and that engine has been in every wow. edition of a microsoft handwriting recognition program since 1990. how is and your handwriting I, jerry are you it's god awful okay it great it's really terrible x projects are this go out to some place like edwards or some awful place where nobody wants to be go out there and you tell them i want you to build the best whatever it is you can build with technology as of this afternoon. You build three copies of it. We test one to the edge of it and we probably prang it. With the second one, we fly and cause we learned from the first until we get all the information out of it. And the third one ends up in the Smithsonian. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jerry's the wordy one. <laughs> yes. I, Larry has told a perfectly good story. It would be publishable now. But when I'm finished with it, it will be probably half again maybe twice as long and then he goes over it and finds some scene that what everybody will remember and they'll forget that i ever had any part in it what the hell i've always been an operations research guy you know i that's a guy who knows less and less about more and more <laughs> until he knows nothing at all about everything <laughs> One last question. You ever going to write your memoir? Maybe, although in a sense I'm writing it now, aren't I? Maybe after a year or two we'd have the whole thing. No, maybe take a little longer than that. How yeah. many people do you know whose personal computer has been <laughs> on display in the Smithsonian? You're the only one I know of. Yeah, probably all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know all of them. <laughs> Thank you.
The great Dr. Jerry Pornell. Uh, it was an honor to consider him a friend. We'll miss him. Thank you, Jerry. And Godspeed. On to the tech news of the week. And uh, I guess Tuesday's the big day. You're coming out, uh, Philip Elmer DeWitt, for the event. I'm very jealous because this will be the first event Apple will hold at its new Apple Park campus in the aptly named Steve Jobs Theater. Yeah, and I've and I've got to uh, apologize for what's going to be a humble brag, uh, you know, where you say, "Geez, I went to the White House and and all I got was it were these stupid matches." <laughs> so so there was, I got wind like everybody else that it was probably going to be September twelfth, and I start worrying about airline prices uh, going up and because yeah, they they never Canada. tell you ahead of time, they give you as little warning as possible. Right. But there was some, you know, you could sort of start putting it together. They weren't going to do it the day after Labor Day. And I think right. maybe the Wall Street Journal leaked it. So I bought my uh, tickets and I uh, rented my car and I arranged a place to stay. Uh, and then the invitations came out and I didn't get one. Oh, oh so I spent oh. like I spent, I don't know, 12 hours, first of all, feeling horrible and forgotten and unloved. And then I started composing in my mind the story about trying to guess which Apple exec I had so pissed off that they had dropped me off the list. And then I thought, rather than r do that, why don't I just reach out to my friend who's the head of PR and see if, you know, and I wrote him, I said, you know, maybe it was an oversight. And he said, yeah, maybe it was. And he sent me an invite. So, I have to feel so like I, they, I, they, they <laughs> kept a few extras for the, for the people like you for, who they missed I hope so. so I, think they, zero, I yeah. think they zeroed out um, a list. It started from uh, scratch. And you think? Wait, yeah, and yeah. waited to see who screamed the loudest. Uh, or a first, thousand or seats something. in the Steve Jobs Theater, but according to their environmental impact report, this is a tidbit, only three. <laughs> I don't know why this is in the EIR. Don't worry. No more than 350 journalists will ever be allowed on the campus at the is same time. Is that what he said? Yes. So, <laughs> so there weren't that many seats. There were only 350 seats. I didn't get invited, but I didn't expect to get invited. Uh, Renee Ritchie, who is one of our hosts on MacBreak Weekly, will be there. I think a couple of people from the, the uh, uh, his uh, publication, imore.com, will be there. Uh, but it's, you know, I think increasingly Apple wants to save those seats for Apple staff. Because well, they need a certain volume because uh, there are these applause lines. Exactly. Uh, and if it's just a room full of journalists, there'll be silence because you know the tradition is, you're not you're not you're not there to cheerlead. You're there to type. Right? Yeah. Uh, so so they need a certain amount of them. And then there's the Al Gore's of the world. Uh, well, he's the, on the board. I'm the, sure every member of the right. board of directors gets to go. Although I I don't think I've ever seen Waz at an Apple event. Have you? Uh, I don't think uh, I have. No. Yeah, Aunt, are you going? <laughs> that would be no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I like the laugh. How about you, Ben? Did you get your invitation or is it stuck in the mail? I didn't try this year and uh, it must be stuck in the mail. But I, um, I've i been in years past and it's it's been uh, it's it's just it's a weird event. And I have to say this might be a little controversial, but I have to say, like, even with the new theater, which I think is really exciting and this revolving door and all this stuff, I feel like 10 years on, it's like it's getting a little tired. Maybe. I don't know. See, I would say that, that but there. people would say, oh, Leo, that's just sour grapes. You've got your nose pressed against the glass, and you don't want it to be inside uh, interesting. But I kind of agree with you. When it was Steve, I mean, yeah. Steve was a master showman, and I was always grateful for the chance just to see him work. In the same way, you know, same way I'd be grateful for a chance to see Frank Sinatra sing. It's you're watching the best at work. Right. But Tim Cook's not exactly Mr. Inspiration. Phil Schiller, Craig Federighi, Eddie Q. These are, <laughs> these are. Yeah. Definitely second Jimmy tier. Ivey, maybe Jimmy Iovine, maybe, and also I think like you, you know the, this. The other thing is the the Steve note, right? Like this is it's become a trope, right? Right. And uh, and I just think that that's I don't know. I I, I mean I'm looking. I'm I'm going to watch obviously, but um, you know I just uh, ten years on I'm I'm looking for something e exciting and different, and I and I guess probably a lot of people are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, will I, I we will hold on a second. I, we will stream it. I just want to mention for people who do want to watch, you can watch 
Of course, Apple will stream it, but you have to have an Apple device to watch it. Actually, you have to watch it on Safari or an Apple device or, weirdly, Microsoft Edge. Edge browser will work if you have Windows 10. Or uh, Edge. Who yeah. do they pay for that? I don't know. It's, uh, they, I guess it has to do with the HLS stream. But uh, we will also stream it. You can watch it on any device, our stream. But the only bad thing about that is I, Megan Maroney, and uh, Alex Lindsay will be, you know, commenting behind it. We're doing our Mystery Science Theater 3000 little silhouette Heck commenting yeah. on that. And that's always fun. But it sometimes annoys people. They go, stop talking. I want to hear what Tim has to say. So you can watch yeah. Tim or you can watch us. Uh, go ahead, Philip. I'm no, sorry. There's no question that, that the quality fell down when after Steve Jobs died. Um, you know, Tim Cook is no Steve Jobs, and we could talk about that for quite a while. And, and some of the guys uh, feel like they're kind of phoning it in. Um, Jimmy Iovine was a disaster, as it turns out. He was a very he's a magnetic personality, but he wandered. Uh, <laughs> you didn't know where he it was going. Stay next. on script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. What a terrible introduction of Apple Music. And then uh, I do think Federici, Federici, how do you pronounce it? I say Federici because it's G-H. Federici. Like spaghetti. Yeah. He's, I mean, it's, he, he's nothing but dad jokes, but at least, <laughs> at least he can, he can so hold true. the stage, you know? He's self-mocking. Um, let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Craig but at least has also the gravitas. He's in charge of iOS and, so and software. Uh, where, whereas you feel like a little bit Phil Schiller, the marketing guy, Eddie Q, uh, the music guy, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, are, they're really shills. And, and yeah, I, even though obviously Steve Jobs was a product shill, he just was so good at it. You forgot that he was selling, that he was marketing to you, 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 you know, and that was the famous reality distortion field. That field. The thing, I, yeah. I look forward to these events. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan of the Apple devices or anything like that, but their presentations are probably the most polished that you'll see out there. You know, even though I did have an issue with Steve Jobs and the magical coin that he put on every Everything single. Everything was magic. You yeah. know, and I'm like, OK, you, you, you're pushing it a little far. I know you're <laughs> the man, Steve Jobs, but come on now. It went over the top when he finally when he said the magic iPod socks that we're introducing. <laughs> I was like, okay, there's nothing magic about socks for your iPod. Please, Steve, please. Uh, but, but. Well, the, the device is supposed to be the, the, that's the main, the, the that's main the thing, right? The that's and the it certainly device. will be this time. Yeah. I mean, what's the alternative well, of a Samsung event? Well, Samsung was Samsung. notoriously bad for a while. I remember it's the Broadway bad. show. Uh, which was God was like, what am I watching? But the last Samsung event, the Note 8 event, actually I thought was pretty well done. But the star of that was not uh, the presenters who were awful, but the really interesting stage. They had a stage, stage that was a screen and then side screens and the graphics flowed to the point where it looked like it was a little tiny person in a giant field or whatever. I thought that was kind of neat. That was beautiful, you know, but I feel bad in those Samsung events because it's almost like they're begging for applause yeah. and the crowd there they, they're just like whatever that's yeah. why oh, you yeah, have to do what me. apple did which is have 650 yeah. employees who are damn well gonna applaud every <laughs> every applause line the pom-poms uh, are out because <laughs> it's their job on the line all right but now in all seriousness uh the big event uh for sunday or tuesday will be of course the new iphone there is now another leak, this coming from the iOS 11 uh, uh, source code, which apparently has a leaked out. And uh, Thomas uh, Stoughton, uh, British name, has analyzed it. And, and interestingly, it looks like the name of the new uh, iPhones will be not 7S, although it really will be a 7S, but iPhone 8 iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone 10 for the 10th anniversary iPhone, and the 10 being an X, which I think is wrong. I'm going to go I'm going to well, go out on a limb here and say that's a mistake. That's not what they're going to call it. They don't even call Mac OS Mac OS 10 anymore. It's just Mac OS. D Philip, come on. Okay. iPhone X? Well, first, a, a couple of things. Uh, for the the uh, you've conflated two leaks. There was one leak that came out for the AirPod, and then there was the other leak that came out Thursday from Mac Rumors and Nine to Five Mac, which which has really pissed Apple off. Oh, um, interesting. To to take a step back, you know the the reason 
they they put a lot of effort into these releases. The reason they're so slick is because they they the jobs used to treat them like Broadway shows, and he would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, and everything is scripted down to the last minute. Uh, and uh, the the uh, the what they count on the the drama of these things is the big reveal where they show something and it's a surprise and uh they this uh the the new iphone whatever they're going to call it has been so thoroughly picked over and so, it spoils so, uh, it, leaks, it? yeah yeah it leaks all around but they had a few things that they'd held back and then what happened was they released the gold master of iOS 11, and I'm on that list. I get the I get the gold master, but I don't know what to do with it. You know, I can't find any secrets in it. And uh, according to John Gruber, who I assume is basically Phil Schiller speaking to us through uh, uh, through the blog, right? Um, said this is the the most damaging rumor in the history of Apple. Uh, the most oh, da damaging leak. More than the release, uh, it, more than the leaving the iPhone 4 in a bar? I know, I know. <laughs> Come yeah, on. But this is what he's saying. And the, and the reason they're upset about it is, you know, that was an accident, leaving it in the bar. This, uh, what, they're, what, what seems to have happened is somebody, there's all this stuff in the gold master, but you have to be a total geek and you have to know where to look to find it. And the suspicion is that some disgruntled employee sent out uh, the the earls to tell people where where do I find the the uh, the the new uh, AirPod thing that has the light on the outside. And there's a little video that shows that. Uh, and the you know where is the name of the yeah there you go these where are assets the, these are digital assets within the gold master right and somebody uh, the theory is somebody leaked it to nine to five mac and and uh, mac rumors and uh, the last remaining surprises uh, leaked out and, and I don't buy that, it. I don't buy it. It can't be the iPhone X. It makes no sense. Yeah. First the of all, half the world will call it the X, which is a terrible name for yeah. the iPhone. Uh, half the world call it 10. They don't have a 10 product anymore. They they deprecated that with macOS. It's clear. I'm going to go out on their limb and say it's not going to be called that. It's going to be the iPhone Pro. They have a Mac Pro, iMac Pro. They have a MacBook Pro. They have an iPad Pro. The only thing that's not in a Pro line is... Is the iPhone? It's the iPhone Pro. What is this X? I think this is all disinformation. X I, I is a variable. Ah. Right. X is a I variable. Mean, right. It's meaningless. Do you, do you, right? Do you think it could be the iPhone edition? You know, with some seventeen thousand dollar price tag like that watch. <laughs> Well, that's one thing we also think. I don't think it'll be 17 grand, but we do expect it to be the most expensive uh, uh, mainstream smartphone ever sold. Right? Twelve hundred bucks. My, my theory. My theory is that, and it's not unique to me, is that they drop the numbers all together, and it's the, it's, the it's, just, it's just the iPhone, the iPhone Plus, and the iPhone Pro is is as good as that anything. That would make sense, because, wouldn't it? Yeah. I think that. Yeah. yeah. So, According, so is this disinformation? Though? Well, won't that be too I, confusing? They for, did it with the, the iPad. Release? That's what we well, said about yeah. the iPad. Fair. They call it the iPad. Fair. How confusing yeah. is that? I have to. But it's not selling. Yeah, right. Well, nobody's buying that Comparatively. one. Comparatively, right? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, we'll find out on Tuesday, and it's kind of a tempest in a teapot. It is. Yeah. Who cares? The, the other thing, <laughs> there's there are even more important things leaked in that than the name. And I guess the main thing is that there's a, an, uh, you can see within it a, a watch face for the Apple Watch that has a little uh, LTE symbol on yeah, it. Yeah, but there we knew go. that. We knew that anyway. We knew that was coming. It, well, you don't know. You've, right. you've heard rumors that it's going to happen, right. uh, and this uh, would be support for that rumor. We're not. We don't know anything until Tuesday. Apple has said uh, nothing. In has fact, has Robert Scoble said anything else about <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. By the ah. way, just am I going to owe? I, I, we, you know this obviously, Ant. I, Robert mm -hmm. was on the show six months ago and said there's going to be a clear iPhone. It's amazing. It's going to be <laughs> augmented reality. It's going to be clear. And I said, Robert, it's not. There is what. And I said, if they make a clear iPhone, I'm buying you uh, dinner in any restaurant in the world. He said, I'm, we're going to Paris. I said, what? Well, uh, Go ahead and get your plane tickets here. Yeah. <laughs> really? You think? Clear iPhone? No, I think I'm safe on this bet, but we'll find here's, out. Here's what I think he was saying, uh, Leon, is that, Leo, is that with the virtual reality. Yeah, you'll look through apps, it. 
Yeah. You'll look through it and it'll yeah. be like you're looking well, through it. Well, I asked it, him that, I think. I'm going to have to go back and check the tape. Fortunately, we record these things. Uh, but I think I said, you don't mean like like Pokemon Go where I could see the grass through the phone. He said, no, no, clear. Yeah. Well, this is my problem with the event in general, though. Like, I think the event in general, we're at this point where we're never actually surprised. Right. It's too bad. By what comes out. There is yeah. no big reveal these days, at least for me. Like, I can't remember the last time I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't even hear about this. And my mind is blown right now. That's the issue that I have. I think generally with with these events is they all of this stuff gets leaked over and over. And I mean, I do think that the the augmented reality look there, there's an area that I think Apple isn't necessarily last on or, or doesn't have to be last on because this is something that there nobody has built a killer app for this. Right. Unless we're talking about Pokemon Go, which in many ways is uh, the, the most mainstream version of augmented reality that anyone has experienced. But, you know, I don't really Really care about food networks ar app no offense to them it just doesn't strike me as amazing but like the walking dead ar app uh could be smart because it combines this entertainment brand with a new kind of app that could be really cool if apple does something really smart and inventive with augmented reality i think that that could uh could actually be a big deal that that would at least make me sort of like stop whatever i'm doing and pay a lot of attention to what they are doing with ar kit for sure we've seen a lot of interesting ar kit demos it is easier to develop for ar kit than something like say google's tango in fact google was forced to respond with ar core which is their version of AR kit, a dumbed down version of Tango. I think that is possible, though. What do you think, Ant? That AR is the VR uh, for for 2017. It is another or or 3D TV for 2017. Another kind of gimmicky idea that just isn't going to get that much traction. Well, no, because if it's Apple doing it it's going to catch on for whatever strange reason. I don't know why. I personally don't don't see AR as, as something that's going to be huge. But, you know, whenever Apple says something, you know, like swipe to lock, man, it's that's the <laughs> most magical thing in the world. You know, so. You, you know, you know what magical. it reminds there it me is. of? Magical. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of when when the, fir the first iPhone came out with that you could it had a thumb, could read your thumb. And I can't remember what it did. It did it unlock the screen, and then it it sort of seemed like, eh, so what? And then like it took two years before yeah. it worked for Apple Pay, and suddenly it was a whole different thing. Yeah, but, and we'd had fingerprint with, readers before, but Apple invented it, of course. <laughs> and right, and but it did change banks. it. It put it on the map. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't actually. Uh, I think there's a. AR on an iPhone feels like a minor thing. I, it's, it's, I've seen, you know, virtual measuring tapes that are kind of cool, and there'll be things like that. Uh, but I don't. I think this is walking up to the glasses. I think Apple is working uh, its way into into having a, uh, AR inside your glasses because you, you're not going to walk around with your phone all day. Uh, looking to see, you know, what what information is out there, but you might actually just look around with your glasses. Yeah. You do, do you ever fly your drone with virtual reality uh, glasses? The FPV. I've yeah. done that a time or two, not with my particular drone, um, but unfortunately, I struggle with vertigo. I mean, I could just get dizzy staring at the camera right now. Yeah. But um, it's a really, really nice experience to fly, but. I don't think anyone should just go out and drop top dollar because it's FPV. Right. You know, it's, it's First sort of, person it's sort of a, if people do it. HoloLens uh, is the most amazing thing that I've seen. You've in used the HoloLens, Ben? Have you used it? I've used the HoloLens twice. And it is I like to me that that was the thing that I I I that really stopped me in my tracks and made me go. Holy crap. This could be huge. Um, I've done two HTC demos of it. Vive did that for me. Yeah. Really? But yeah. The thing I about mean, the HoloLens, cool too, it's but, been yeah. two years, and I haven't seen any improvement. No. So Microsoft no, put a problem. lot behind this. They said it's not coming out till 2019. And this is the problem Apple's going to have, too. Yeah, sure, if we could get spectacles that looked like normal glasses, not like some sort of weird Sergey Brin Borg geek thing, mm -hmm. uh, right, like the Google more. Glass, uh, then maybe there'd be a market. But that technology it has to have a standalone, powerful computer in a pair of 
spectacles you can walk around with with enough battery life. You know, it's got to have more than a th few hours battery life. Uh, oh, yeah. those, it has to have some sort of heads-up display in the glass. All of this, I don't think we're that close. Yeah, no, I don't no, think so either. It's going to be terribly uh, but, expensive. And, and price, right. It's got to cost something you could afford. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but you know, we, you say that about every technology coming down the pike. Uh, what Apple brings to it is uh, they've got a, a, a huge crowd of developers who are eager to be early on whatever the next thing is going to be. Uh, because the first uh, the first to arrive make all the money, so they're they're working on AR kit stuff. And the other thing Apple brings to the party is they've got uh, whatever five or six or seven or eight hundred million devices that can run this stuff, or they will by the time you know. Well, that's the biggest have... leap, isn't it? All of a sudden, yeah. Every iPhone, I think, it was from the six S on, can do this. Uh, that's a right. giant market all of a sudden out of nowhere. Right. So it, it doesn't take too many interesting apps uh, for people to try it out. Uh, and it could it could be something that people make money on the iPhone for a while. Uh, I do. Th it does feel like uh, until there's a new it, it's on the inside of a car windshield or it's on inside the glasses. It, it doesn't feel like a hugely significant technology to me i want to take a little break when we come back i want to talk about the uh, uh other major technology that will apparently be revealed in the new iphone that uh apple was forced to include because they couldn't figure out how to make touch id work through the screen and that's face id or face recognition our guest Stamp pruitt who's joining us from tech republic contributing writer there photographer droner podcaster and a clemson fan you know it. <laughs> Most importantly, uh, also with us, Ben Johnson. You hear him on the Codebreaker podcast. He's the creator there. Heard him for a long time at Marketplace. Their tech co a columnist there. Molly Wood's taken his place, and he's got something new in the works. We'll find out about that someday. Not today. Someday. And someday. Like Monday. <laughs> That's a bigger announcement than the Apple announcement. Forget the Apple announcement. What's <laughs> happening Monday? And it's good to have you, Ben. And also Thank with you. us, uh, of course, the great Philip Elmer DeWitt from PED30.com, Apple Watcher, and uh, and somebody who will actually be at the Apple event on Tuesday. I think I, I want you to explore the new Steve Jobs Theater and look for secret places. Well, you know, the new Facebook rules say that if you have at least 100 followers, and I think I have 112 on Facebook, you can shoot live and it goes straight I, up. A little point I'd like to just mention. The last time I was at an Apple event in 2010, the iPod, I'm sorry, yeah, the iPad announce, I live streamed it. I turned my computer around, live stream Steve Jobs, and I've never been invited back, Philip. Just want to mention. Oh, well, no, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't going to wise. live stream yeah, the event because I'd be I'd be competing with Apple's much higher res. <laughs> they didn't version. have a stream but, then. That's what I thought. Well, cause somebody ought to do this. I've got all these cameras behind me. Uh, did they complain to you? No, they said not a word. I just never got invited back. Yeah, I don't it even. It may be. not be related was, to that at all. I have no idea. I don't know. Well, you, you know, maybe because you bad enough Apple so frequently. On, on I don't think show. unfairly, do I? I'm fair to Apple. <laughs> yeah. No, you uh, think I'm unfair it. to Apple? No, no, I don't think you're unfair. Uh, you you come with a Windows uh, friendly. That's so untrue. I am not uh, Windows friendly. I have owned every Mac. I bought a, a Mac in 1984 in the first 100 days. I've owned every you, iPhone. You I'm a, every you own every piece of technology that comes well that's true pike. but but i hated <laughs> windows for a long time it's only recently i think windows has become a, a fair rival to a macintosh and mostly because apple has neglected its strengths and produced crappy hardware in the last couple of years and its operating system started getting superannuated thank goodness for apfs the new file system uh, that's what I. That's what I. I'm mean. honest. Anyway, I was, uh, <laughs> that's called honest. <laughs> good skepticism. I like his I'm skepticism. I'm honest. I'm yeah, not an yeah, Apple yeah, fanboy. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I am. This is why it hurts me a little bit that you said that, Phil, because I am an Apple fanboy. I I want them to do better. I'm disappointed that they haven't lately. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Anyway, I was, all I was going to say is that I'm just going to shoot the. I think what people want to see is the inside of the Steve Jobs Theater and whatever I else. Stream that. I'll watch show that. Us yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. Yeah. So that's, I'm going to be. It's the most Doctor Evil-looking thing I've ever seen. 
Well, there's also. I mean, I questions. haven't seen it, but it's yeah, well. But like, yeah. it's a glass. So there's the glass. Uh, the entry way is this big glass, wide open um, thing, which it's not clear. Is that going to be the demo area? There will be a demo area. There's some. If you look at the plans, there's something underneath. There's escalators down. It's the world's mm -hmm. largest carbon fiber roof on top of it. But you, you, the theater is underground. Very Doctor Evil. And so yeah. you take the escalators to the underground theater. If that's the demo area, somebody said that there are walls, automated walls that can come up and hide the demo area. So when you enter, it'll be blacked out, and then you'll go in and go down, and then after the event, the walls will come down, and then the whole world will be able to see through the glass. I don't know. These are th And then the floor opens up, and there's a pool with sharks with freaking laser beams <laughs> on their heads. Lasers. I think that's, yeah. <laughs> it is so Dr. Evil. What's this rotating elevator you were saying? Oh, yeah. There's, there's like a, them, a right? loading yeah. elevator that. I yeah. love the fact that you're trolling them about Dr. Evil. You know, <laughs> considering the chair that you're sitting in right now. Oh, wait a minute. That's, uh, well, you're right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Look at your chair, man. All I need is a naked cat. This is definitely. <laughs> watch this. <laughs> Dr. Evil doesn't have a microphone to knock over. That's all I'm That was a. Oh, did I kill my that was mic? beautiful. All right. You can hear me still? <laughs> okay. Little tip for Dr. Evils. If you're going to be an evil genius, make sure your mic is clear. Our show today brought to you by Qualcomm. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. One of the things will be interesting to see if Apple uh, continues to use the best LTE radios out there, the Qualcomm LTE radios. Remember in the last iPhone, they did 50-50. And uh, the Intel radios they put in were not so fast. So they slowed down the Qualcomm radios so that nobody would feel bad. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't want you to feel bad. Look, if you're going to get a, a new phone, get an Android phone with a Qualcomm Snapdragon Gigabit LTE radio in it. With additional lanes for data to flow on, 4x4 MIMO, 256 QAM. These are, it's got carrier bonding. These are the fastest LTE phones ever made. The Note 8, the S8, the S8 Active, the Z Force, the HTC U11, because they've got this amazing LTE radio designed to deliver the fastest mobile connectivity and help speed things up, even in crowded places. You could turbocharge all your connected apps, stream 360 degree videos and YouTube VR and 4K resolution with minimal buffering, minimal stuttering. And lest you feel guilty, it's better for everybody because. It makes everybody's connection faster, even in congested networks. If you if you don't have to feel bad because everybody's getting better performance. Gigabit LTE, as much as seven times faster than your home Wi-Fi. Carrier aggregation, 4x4 MIMO. You can read all about this, 256 QAM. If you go to the website, snapdragon.com slash gigabit. Make the most of your unlimited data plan. To learn more about faster network connections in crowded places, snapdragon.com slash gigabit gigabit we thank qualcomm so much really happy to have qualcomm as an advertiser for their uh support of this week in tech so let's by the way i was just reading uh, john gruber's wow you're right he was scathing uh john yeah. gruber's uh, daring fireball article about this apple leak uh he can he says the bbc has confirmed what he already knew that the leak was sent by an Apple employee. Gruber says, I could state with nearly 100% certainty that it was. I think there's a good chance Apple's going to find out who it was. He says, these URLs, these URLs that were hidden in the Gold Master were not discovered by guessing, but because they were published at obvious URLs prematurely, somebody who works at Apple emailed these URLs to 9to5Mac and Mac rumors possibly without even knowing just how much information could be gleaned from them. He says, let me clarify that sentence. Whoever leaked these URLs knew it would be an incredibly damaged, damaging leak. Uh, and he says, this person should be ashamed of themselves and should be very worried when their phone next rings. They, so They should be worried because uh, Apple famously hired former uh, CIA and NSA <laughs> uh leak busters to chase these guys down and uh i wouldn't i wouldn't want and they you know there were uh um 
Mark Gurman was the guy who was doing most of the leaking when he was still at 9 right. to 5 Mac before he went to Bloomberg. And it was clearly coming from the inside. Uh, it wasn't stuff coming from uh, Taiwan. You know, it was the it was inside the software uh, leaks. And uh, a couple guys got fired shortly after. Yeah. <laughs> so they, oh, they they'll get them. fired. But Steve Jobs yeah. was famous for... He would uh, hire new people and put them on bogus projects for a few, for a you know a hundred day trial period to see if they leaked anything about the bogus project, and he would know it was them because no one else was working on it. Or he would give people selective information and wait to see what leaked. Jobs was no notoriously paranoid. Uh, it was funny because the leak anti leak training that Apple gives to its new employees was leaked, so. And Apple, right, quite rightly, said in this anti-leak training, it spoils it. It spoils it for us. It spoils it for everybody. Your colleagues are working hard on new products. And a big part of the new product is the launch, the release, the unveiling. Our fans, our customers love it. It's important for us in, in marketing terms. And, and you can really spoil it. So, yeah, I agree with you. Gruber obviously got a call from his buddy, Phil, who said... <laughs> We're going to get this guy. And yeah. uh, yeah, what, what's left out of that, though, is, I mean, OK, I feel bad for the guys at Apple who work so hard and we're hoping that they could keep it a surprise. But, you know, the look at it from the journalist point of view. There's a lot of people who are, who are trying to make a living uh, uh, retailing whatever information they can get about Apple. There's thousands of investors who who love this stuff. Uh, and, you know, the journalists are working hard. And it's our and, job. Yeah. For instance, and you know, we do it. I think partly we do it because we know you're interested. There's a, I mean, look, you want to get a link, you know, your articles, your blog posts read. You want to get your podcast listened to. You talk about Apple rumors, but also I think there's a very legitimate need to know on the part of consumers because they right now you can buy an essential phone, a Note Eight. You can maybe hold off for the Pixel. You're wondering what's what Apple's going to do. Should I wait or not? And this is consumer information. I think it's absolutely appropriate to tell us tell everything we know. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's totally certainly not agree. our job to protect Apple secrets. No. Right? No, that's their job. Apparently a job they do right, quite well. Right, that's their job. Yeah. I always wonder, you know, with leaks like that, especially coming from an internal uh, employee, what is their motivation? You know, is it money? Uh, is it just an axe to grind or, or what? Because you're working at Apple, I would presume you have it pretty good as a staffer there and not someone that's in one of the factories. But... Yet you still want to potentially leak out some information to the press. And I apologize for Kylo Finn back here barking at the rabbits in the window. But <laughs> your, wait a minute. Your it, dog is named? Kylo Finn. <laughs> is that some yes. sort of Star Wars reference? That would be correct, sir. <laughs> but kind of kind of like a messed up Star Wars reference? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, Again, but uh, we had this conversation, now. actually. It's funny you should mention this, Ant, because uh, on Windows Weekly this week, I asked Mary Jo Foley, who is kind of like Mark Gurman for Microsoft. She gets a lot of uh, information. Why do people talk to you? And she's, there are a lot of reasons. Some of it is disaffected employees. And as good as it is working at Apple, there's got to be some people who are unhappy, right, working at the fruit factory. And then it, some of it is the glory, Right. I know something no one knows. I'm going to, you know, I like I like being able to be the first person to tell you, Mary Jo, about this thing. There's lots of reasons people leak. And, of course, people like Mark Gurman and Mary Jo Foley uh, spend a lot of energy cultivating sources for that reason exactly. Then you yep. get into the whole code of ethics for your employer, you know. Just, I don't, I, I don't get it myself, personally. Yeah. Someone was asking uh, within the White House, which is, you know, leaks like a sieve, uh, why they were doing it. And they said, oh, it's therapy. It's, it's, I need to get, <laughs> I this, gotta I tell need to get somebody. this off my chest. <laughs> I got to tell somebody. You won't believe what happened today. This is going to kill me. Get it off my chest, please. Uh, it, might be. <laughs> it makes you feel important. There's a lot of there's a lot of reasons. You're right, though. I mean, obviously, it's 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 not good for the company. It's unethical. You're 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 violating your commitment to the company that you work at. You shouldn't do it. Uh, but as a journalist, I'm glad we get leaks. I don't actually deal in leaks. Um, I deal in other people's leaks. Like, I, we talk about people who have got leaks. So I'm glad there's people like Mary Jo and, and Mark, Fol Mark uh, Gurman who do this. 
So I try to avoid rumors because it, yeah, um, it's not useful. You know what? It, unless you can confirm it, what's it doesn't help. But at this point, I feel like a lot of these rumors are, are you know, there's a convergence as you get closer and closer to these events. A yeah. lot of them yes. at this point are, have to be true, right? Yes. And we've been to enough. We've been to enough keynotes where it turned out, yeah, they were true. It is kind of disappointing when you when you get a keynote and you go, oh, we knew all that. Yeah. That's Happens why every I'm. Year. Yeah, that's why I am of the of the very uh, probably wrong opinion that that this most recent leak is disinformation. That Apple knew that uh, they prepared this information, and it will not be the iPhone eight and eight plus or iPhone X. It is going to be something else, and it's disinformation. Uh, and 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 then they'll be then. I mean, wouldn't doesn't it is it not unreasonable to think that Apple might do that? Be that sophisticated. Yeah. I, that was well, at a certain point, thought. they have to, right? At a certain point, this has happened enough times now, and it's a regular enough thing that we basically know what's going to be happening with the new device before we actually see the new device. Right. At a certain point, you have to imagine that a company like Apple has to say, well, we need to, we need to figure out a way to fight back against this. So I don't think that's an unreasonable conspiracy theory at all. One of the stories came out of the, the Wall Street Journal, actually a story we've been hearing for months, but they can, they, they repeated it this week, that uh, Apple had, you know, in order to increase the bezel on the new iPhone, and everybody's doing that. If you're going to get a, 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 a flagship phone this year, you're going to get a flagship phone that has a, a bigger screen without a bigger phone. That's the holy grail. And no does, chin, no forehead. Does, does it by re eliminating both the side frames, the bezels, but also the forehead at the top of the chin at the bottom but of course you do that on an iphone you eliminate the the home button which does two things it's it's a very important navigation button on the iphone because a lot of apps <laughs> it's the only way to get out of the app I, there, I haven't seen a quit in any app in years on the iphone you're supposed to press the home button so that's the quit button as much as anything else the back button uh but also it's touch id Apple didn't do what others have done, put the Touch ID on the back. Apple, according to the journal, tried to make the Touch ID work through the screen. If the screen's the whole front of the phone, you put your finger somewhere on that front and it would read your finger. They couldn't get it working. They thought they would. And they went to plan B late in the production cycle. So the journal says that means these phones will be in very short supply until next year, these new phones. Holiday. I really love the edge to edge. I, I, I do mean, too. the edge to edge, it, it's just like as an Android user, um, you know, I think it's it's um, it's the only way that I, I want agree. to look at my phone. I want that screen space. I'm a little bit I'm, I have to say I'm a little bit on the fence about the home button. Um, you know, I, it's been a while since I used an iPhone. But but like, I mean, on the one hand, the physical button seems pointless these days. Right. I mean, um, set the biometrics aside for a second. The, the, the physical button seems pointless in some ways because everything else you do is on the screen itself um but on the other hand you know on the other hand when my android phone geeks out and i hit the home button and it doesn't work um I, you know i want to throw my phone out the window and i feel like the physical button somehow like helps it's mitigate reassuring. the helplessness yeah. that you feel yeah exactly so yeah. you know For i many I, years you know, when people ask about phone recommendations, you know, I have to consider what type of person is asking me this. And if it's someone that's not going to understand rooting and rhyming and things like that, I would always tell them, go get the iPhone because the second yep. you screw something up, just hit that home button. You're good. <laughs> that's a really yeah. good point. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the panic button. Pretty much. Yeah. The, some of the rumors are that the, the on-off switch or what the screen on-off switch will now become the new home button or at least assume some of that functionality. They'll be, it'll be overloaded. There'll be multiple things that that button can do. That's going to be difficult to discover, difficult to use. And then because they lost the fingerprint reader, they're going to do face recognition. They're going to apparently, according to rumor, call it face ID. Uh, raises a lot of questions. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I buy that journal story. I tried to trace. Uh, I tried to address the question: Are they really going to kill the um, touch ID? Is the fingerprint recognition really going away? And it, it, it there's only a handful of original sources on that story. It goes back to the the Taiwanese guy whose name I always forget. Uh, Ming Chi Kuo. Ming Chi Kuo. Yeah, that's Digit Times. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, he said definitively in February, I think it was, that it was that they definitely were going to kill it for the reason that the Wall Street Journal gave is that they couldn't get it to work. Samsung couldn't get it to work under the glass screen and neither could Apple. After that, uh, people kind of, I, I read Mark Gurman very carefully. He it was sort of maybe it was he didn't know for sure. And neither did uh, the guys at iMore. Uh I I think it would be crazy to get rid of the fingerprint recognition system that millions of people have learned how to use to uh, pay, use Apple Pay and to unlock their phone, even if the face ID thing is better and works perfectly you don't want to take stuff away. It's like you don't want to take away Social Security when they've got it. Um, so I'm skeptical. I'm waiting to see. This is one of the surprises. Did they? What is the name? What is the price? And did they really kill Facebook recognition? I'm face, waiting to see. Fa uh, touch ID. Uh, yeah. Touch ID. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. there's a lot of questions face recognition raises. Of course, how, it can't be always looking for your face. So yeah. it's got to, you've got to it trigger is. it somehow with a gesture of, of a, a button press or a noise or something. Uh, it, you pick it up. You pick up the phone, I think, and the movement. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. We will see. And, we'll of see. course, there, it, 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 it's from a security point of view, it's a disaster. All uh, you know, Let's say you know, uh, the police want to see the phone. All they have to do is put the phone in your face and then say thank you. I mean, this is not... a really interesting. This is a really interesting point, right? Because this is this is like this is this thing. This is part of the whole like Apple versus FBI thing. What we yeah. one of the things we learned from that battle was this distinction between um, what you are and what you know. Right. And in and, and in in the case of what you are in the courts, the, the, the courts essentially can't you can be forced to give up your fingerprint, um, have something look at your face, give up your blood, I suppose. Um, but in terms of what, you know, in terms of an alphanumeric code that unlocks your phone, the authorities can't actually make you provide that or at least not as easily. And I think that's really interesting to think about. I mean, look, I'm I, I'm not worried necessarily about the authorities coming to bang and kicking down my door and saying, you know, we need whatever's in your phone, look, look, look at your phone so that we can get into it. But I do think it's something that at least I think about when I think about biometrics more generally is like um, if if I have an alphanumeric code, um, like nobody can force me to give that over. Um, or at least it's it's very hard comparatively to biometrics. And I think biometrics is a little bit could there's a little bit of an ick factor there for me. Um, just the fact that 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 the authorities can much more easily get you to provide that. I should point out, though, that this even that uh, putative protection uh, against something, you, you know, you have or something, you know, we know that, you know, you can be compelled to give a fingerprint a hair for DNA analysis and all of that. The courts have upheld that. That's that doesn't violate your right against self-incrimination. But you know, there's a right. guy, a former Philadelphia police officer, who's been in jail now for two years, not because they convicted him of a crime, but because he would not reveal the password to decrypt his hard drives. <laughs> yeah. So, so sad. Uh, and he's appealed, and the courts have upheld the. You know, and and he will. You know, he is on an indefinite jail term because he's not going to give it up crazy uh so that, don't that don't assume i only reason i bring that up is don't assume that you know just because you only you know the password that that protects they can't you. punish you yeah, yeah yeah totally totally agree yeah yeah am yeah. i the only person that's concerned about the pricing of this particular no. iphone or heck any of the other flagship phones of recent yeah that's it's been slowly ramping up hasn't it the the note 8 is 930 to 960 bucks getting really close to a thousand Dude, my first car was nowhere near that price. <laughs> know. You know what I'm saying? I, I grew up when I grew up. You could buy a Volkswagen brand new for two thousand dollars. So I exactly. can exactly. <laughs> like, how is this even? I, I don't quite get it. I look at the pricing, and I tried to think back over the last several years, and I remember the whole uh, conspiracy theory of planned obsolescence or whatever, right. and. I don't. Uh, Do you think it it's a like kind of digital redlining? Two years. Do you think it's kind of a digital redlining? Like, uh, well, you have to be rich basically to own a flagship phone. That's what it sounds like, you know. And, and I don't think that's fair because it's a phone. <laughs> it's just the phone. I Even agree. if it's something like the. And I love my Pixel because um, it, it's not only a phone, but it actually helps me with content creation too. Right. You know. But right. it's still. 
Dad gum it expensive, man. Good grief. I'm we don't sorry know how expensive it's coming out. But and 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 <laughs> traditionally the rumors about pricing have not been right. Uh, Apple's very good at kind of telegraphing a higher price and then surprising everybody, making everybody feel good about nine hundred fifty dollars when they're expecting twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> and that may be what happens, but that is the rumor. Twelve hundred bucks starting price, then thirteen hundred dollars for 256 gigs of RAM and $1,400 for 512 gigs of RAM. So crazy. Uh, when we paid $500 for phones, you know, it seemed like it was a decent value because you knew you were going to get at least two years out of that for those $500, right. in my opinion. And sometimes even longer. I know I've had a few phones that I kept longer than the, the particular cycle, upgrade cycle came around. But now, just that's just too much. I mean, I, I cringe when I got this Pixel, but I've been waiting for maybe three years or so. So I'm like, okay, I'm due, and I will hold on to this Pixel for probably another two more years. But I, I just don't know if every consumer feels that way. It was a disappointment. I remember when Google announced the price on the Pixel, though, because they had made less expensive Nexus phones yeah. for several generations, and all of a sudden the Pixel was priced at the same flagship phone price as other competing phones I would, when hasn't I the iphone my, always been okay not to get it <laughs> hasn't the iphone always been considered a luxury device though in fairness i mean like i i you know i i take your point and that the the you know you had a longer you had a longer relationship with that phone in the beginning right and it right. felt like you were getting a lot of bang for your buck but I, but i also feel like i mean it seems to me like the iphone has all, all, always been considered to a certain degree a luxury device or, or a device that's like sort of top of line, right? The newest iPhone. Here's what I would yeah. submit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What because if Apple, second... what if Apple offers a, as they do now, and like the iPhone SE, a relatively lower cost phone, medium prices with an iPhone eight and eight plus or seven S and seven S plus. And then, and this is, I feel like I understand they're going to get hit just as they got hit for the 12, $17,000 Apple watch. And perhaps rightly so. But but on the other hand, I wouldn't mind if Apple said, look, what if we designed a phone and we just put everything in it that we could? We made it as good as we could without regard to price. And then we're going to charge what we have to charge for it. But we thought there are some of you who are less price sensitive, who want to see the state of the state of the art. I, I think I could accept that. The real problem I have is I don't know if it will be state of the state of the art. I don't know. I mean, look, at uh, we've had OLED screens on phones for years. Uh, they're not the first to do a, a bezel-less full, full screen design. Um, they're dropping. They've already dropped the headphone jack, which I frankly consider a necessity in a, in a smartphone. I, I hate that. I hate it's that crazy. they did that. And they're about to drop Touch ID, which they made to be the be-all and end-all of authentication on a phone. I don't know if this phone's going to be worth 1200 bucks, but... I, I wouldn't be against a company saying, look, we're gonna, just going to make the best thing we can regardless of price. But I don't, I don't know if this will be that. There's a, a little piece of economic data. Uh, when they introduced the 7 Plus, they broke the rule that every increment was $100 right. more than the one underneath it. And they went to 130 And then they watched to see what economists uh, call the price in a, in elasticity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what they discovered is that they sold more of them, not less. So that raising the price uh, didn't hurt them. It, in fact, for a lot of different reasons, it went up, not necessarily because of the price. My guess is nine ninety nine is probably the the entry point for this. And my guess is that price in elasticity will still take effect, and they will sell as many of these things as fast as they can make them into next year. It'll be a long, it'll be a long time until you can wait. buy one of these things, just because it won't be available. Right, and and I that for Apple, that. that's a that's a good problem to have. I because they want to make remember money. when Apple uh, made a MacBook. And they made it in the traditional silver, and then they offered a black version of it for a hundred bucks more. You were paying a hundred bucks for paint, yeah. and it and it outsold all the other models. Yeah. Apple's known for a long time this lesson. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so the the other thing is that Apple has decided that the way they're going to uh, offer cheaper phones is to keep selling the older versions uh, at a discount. And, um, you know, that, 
I, they're saying if you want the premium phone, you're going to have to pay for it. If you want the iPhone experience, you can get a pretty good one for uh, is pretty much the the price of the com uh, competition, a little bit more. And it, it uh, is interesting that Google has responded to this with something they call Android One. This is there's a couple of features of Android One. One is that it will be as close to pure Android as possible, even though it won't be made by Google, and it will be guaranteed security patches and updates. The first Android One phone is out. It's from Motorola, the X4. And uh, it is fairly, I have to look at the pricing, but I think it's under $400. And so so Google, I think, understands, first of all, they understand two things. One, that low-priced phones, Android, most of the uh, reason Android has so many models out there is most of the Android phones are low-priced. Uh, but also that there's an issue with these low-priced phones. They're not getting updates. So... Um, this is Evan Blass, Evleeks has leaked this uh, Motorola X4, uh, which is, and on the back it says powered by Android One. I think this is still a leak. I don't think this has become official, so I don't know what the price will be. But that would make a lot of sense. There's Evan's uh, leak. If you click on that image, I think it, Carson, you'll see the full, si full phone. And at the bottom it says Android One. Yeah, there you go. My anyway, parents both have Motorola's, and they and they're really solid phones. The I G4, mean, um, yeah, G5, yeah. the new one, uh, the E. These yep. are good phones, and uh, there is a market. So, I kind of honor Google and uh, for, and, and its partners like and, like Motorola for making phones normal people can afford that you don't give up every flagship feature. But as long as those things exist, or an iPhone SE exists. I, I do like the idea that there is there is a phone where we're going to spare no expense to make the best thing we can make. How how do you like it? And who else but a Apple? Apple's got the audience for it. So I'm not ex I don't know. I understand I understand your point, Ant. I agree. You know, and and there and somebody in the chat room said you know there are people who have to buy an, an iPhone for security reasons. Journalists in uh, in um, tough nations where you know security is paramount they don't buy android true, phones true and the u.s government a bunch of but isn't the u.s government have, haven't they been like the federal government been transitioning to iphones yeah over the past like what five you, years what do you something guys like think that? do you think the um that android is that insecure and that iphone is the only secure solution I can't say that it that it is, but there's always some writing on the wall about an issue with the Android security. Seems like hardly it, huh? ever hear it on the Apple side. Yeah, hardly ever hear it. Yeah, as big as the Apple brand is, you you hardly ever hear security issues. And it's no accident that Tim Cook made a huge deal about standing up to the FBI. Right. Uh, there, that that was a that was a marketing just uh, you know on brand. Not Very to say he brand. doesn't believe it. Yeah. But it's a branding uh, exercise, and I think it worked pretty well for them. Um, I, I think so. I mean, it is, I, I love Androids, and I, I, I'm, you know, I use a Mac. Um, I've got a Mac laptop, but I, um, I've had Androids for a long time, and I, uh, I think, generally speaking, I'm okay. I like the customizability, and so i generally speaking, I'm okay with dealing with some of the security challenges or at least being you know i i'm okay with taking that risk but generally speaking you're at least I, you cognizant know, I, of the security challenges though you're not the average user you're at least aware of the security issues exactly exactly so i do think like as you said before Ant, uh, i think you were you were saying that you recommend people depending on their how serious of a user they are um you know an iPhone is, is a really good option in some ways. And plenty of serious users use iPhones too, but I think that, you know, generally speaking, it, it does seem fair to say that that iPhones are more secure. You know you know who's big fans of the uh, of the iPhone? The Boston Red Sox. <laughs> this story was the best. I love this story. It's kind of goofy because you could, you know, so the Red Sox have been accused of stealing signs. This is a, in baseball, you know. Uh, this happens in football too. Uh, in baseball, the catcher sends signs to the um, the pitcher what pitch to throw. The coaches will send signs to base runners and and hitters as to what to do in the next play. And if the opposing team could figure out what the plans were, it'd be a lot easier to get guys out. Apparently, uh, the Red Sox 
were sent, I don't know, how, Philip, you, you talk about this in, on the, your blog. What were they doing? Were they texting each other? I mean, it really didn't no, require no. an Apple Watch to do this, right? Well, I think uh, my, uh, my assumption, because if you're texting, you might as well use hand signals. Why get fancy? Right. Uh, my assumption was that they were sending video to the Apple Watch. And what was what, uh, <laughs> what I love is that Tim Cook had visited the, the Red Sox dugout I don't know how much how much earlier, but they'd given him a he was wearing a whole Red Sox uniform and a Red Sox hat and he posed with them. And I can just see Cook saying, look, look what you can do with this watch. You can actually send video through it. Um, and, <laughs> There's uh, no and, camera on the watch. The video can't be taken by the watch, but you could you could no, show it's, video. It's, Right, you can yeah. you can send it. So this is what the New York Times said: the Yankees, who had long been suspicious of the Red Sox stealing catchers' signs in Fenway Park, said that they there was video of the from the broadcast, I believe, showing a member of the Red Sox training staff looking at his Apple Watch in the dugout and then relaying a message to other players in the dugout who would signal teammates in the field about the kind of pitch he was going to get. Something something yeah. happened. The way I understood the story, and I'm not a baseball expert, but the way I understood the story was was somebody at second base was hand signaling. <laughs> Does this make sense? No, no. Does this is what this is. No, the commissioner's office confronted the Red Sox, who admitted their trainers had received signals from video replay personnel, and then relayed that information to Red Sox players. This Whoa. has been going on for several weeks, and apparently. You know, they obviously, the video replay personnel had iPhones, which they would then either send the image or it would be just as easy to say it's going to be, uh, you know, a fastball high and inside uh, in a text message that the trainer could then see in, in the watch. The Red is, Sox you don't have to, yeah, res go. responded by filing a complaint against the Yankees, <laughs> saying <laughs> the team uses a camera from its Yes television network exclusively, like a dedicated camera to steal signs during the game. The Yankees denied it. I don't think the Apple Watch really is a big part of this story, but I thought it was funny that the Apple Watch even made the uh, tabloids. Uh, dirty socks, Apple caught red-handed using Apple Watch to cheat versus Yanks. This uh, this must be, is this the Daily News, uh, Philip, uh, or the yeah, Post? It's all of them. It's all, the it's New all York, of them. All the New York yeah. dailies. How do you like the them, Apples? Red Sox fess up. They even have a uh, an Apple Watch with a Boston Red Sox watch band <laughs> saying, <laughs> but, Wicked but Curve I, coming. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the, tech, this is the techiest version of Red Sox suck, no Yankees suck. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it just cracked. Wicked Curve coming. Watch out there. Wow. <laughs> Wow! But did you know that it's against uh, league rules to use any electronics in the oh, dugout? So that's it. I mean, that's, that's why. That's really, this, that's antique. That's why this is an important story because an Apple Watch, which could ostensibly just be a wristwatch, is in fact an electronic device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't use iPhones. You can't use. Well, there you they go. Can use telephones. There's one telephone they can use. So that's why this is important. This this was a way that they could send that text message or whatever, a video or a text message. It seems like you'd send a text message. Uh, well, the text, you'd have to type it. That would take so long. Uh, <laughs> Not on the watch. <laughs> the guys in the video booth go. It's, yeah, yeah. We're going to send this up. And then they, I don't know. Maybe the, you're saying they sent a picture of the of the signal. I think the live signal of the guy, uh, of what the catcher is doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so crazy. Because you're in the dugout. You can't see it, right? He's, he's hiding it down here in, in his crotch. Uh, okay. Well, I just thought that was the that was the cutest story of the week. Since we're innovating, doing, innovate, innovation, <laughs> courage, my friends, courage. Apple has also canceled the Apple Music Festival. I'm sad to hear that. They, for ten years, Apple had been doing these great live all through the month of September live concerts that you can free, watch on iTunes. Free, concerts. free. We went. Lisa and I were going to be in London uh, towards the end of September uh, a couple of years ago. We asked uh, our friends uh, at the iTunes. Uh, James said, uh, over that iTunes, could you get us in? And we, we went to a show. It was really fun in the Roundhouse in London. And they do a beautiful job of streaming it. But I guess... I well, someone in my chat room said that uh, it wasn't so much that they were giving up on this as that they had pivoted to some new business model. Uh, I don't know if it's carpool karaoke or some... <laughs> I hope they, it's not. They wanna, they, <laughs> Planet the, of the, the Apps, I hope this, not. 
<laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, but the but the the trouble with the roundhouse, it was it was just very local. Only someone in London right. could see it unless right. he streamed it. And right. they now have other. They they really want to. They're competing with the other the with the other music streamers, and they've got to find some edge that something that they can do exclusive uh, for Apple Music, or they're going to die. Yeah. All right, we're going to stop with the Apple. I know you've all. We always have the people say, okay, you talked about Apple for an hour. Okay, we're done. We're the Apple. We're going to talk about okay. Russia and Facebook. We're going to talk about, of course, about Equifax and a lot more. We've got a great panel here. Philip Elmer DeWitt. He says, okay, because he's like, I don't have anything else to say. Is that it? Philip, I can go home now, right? You can go home. <laughs> no, no, stay, stay, please. PED30, his, uh, his great new website. I call it new. You've been doing it for a while now, right? Year and a half. Yeah. It feels new to me. Uh, and new to me every morning. Yeah, and soon he'll be getting an early morning flight to Cupertino for the Big Apple event on Tuesday, and we'll we'll get you back on soon to get your because uh, one of the reasons you want to go to that event is they have the demo room. You can go play with it and all that. Yeah, you can yeah. show it your face. Somebody said, "Here's how you make the iPhone secure. The face recognition is secure uh, is you make a face when it's when you're signing it up. You go, and then." It doesn't work unless you make that same face. And that way you're safe because no one will know what face to make. Well, it's, it apparently is, it's using 3D so that... I want you, you to try that, you can, would you? The only yeah, negative I, you is that... Put on a clown mask. Then from then on, anytime you want to unlock your phone, you have to go... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> People are going to think, Wait, he's, a, he's a nice guy, but does he have a tick? What is, <laughs> what is going on there? Ben Johnson also here from Code Breaker, the podcast. And, uh, great to have him. And somebody great I've been to be here. wanting to get on for a long time. So nice to have you. And, and uh, speaking of getting on for a long time, Ant Pruitt, one of the best photographers, drone guys out there. He's a contributing writer at Tech Republic. And uh, it's been a, a long overdue getting you on the show. Thank you for joining us with your very Thank white you. voice. I like that. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Just say, just for me, just say, when a man and a woman... No, no, actually better not. Let's uh, <laughs> you play get a little a whole music. different rate of Yeah, yeah. You know, baby, <laughs> I love it. I love it when you come close to me. And our show, <laughs> I'm sorry, brought <laughs> to you by Zip Recruiter. Are you looking to hire a tech professional or anybody in any business? There's no better way than Zip Recruiter. You might say, well, I know, you know, I, I'm going to hire, I'll go to the site where those people hang out or whatever. But it doesn't work that way. You, the perfect employee might be out there, but just not looking at the job site you posted to. So why not use ZipRecruiter? Post to 100-plus job sites. With one click, ZipRecruiter puts it everywhere. So you have the maximum reach. Even Twitter and Facebook, the most people will see that job posting, which almost guarantees that that right person will see it. That's the one you want, the guy who, or gal who's perfect for that job. Now, you might say, well... Hey, that's fine, Leo, but does this mean my phone's going to ring off the hook and my inbox will overflow? No, no, no. That's the beauty of this because all of those candidates pour into the ZipRecruiter interface. They don't call you. They don't email you. It goes into the ZipRecruiter interface. You can screen them with true, false, yes, no, essay questions. You can, you can eliminate people who don't work. Rank the rest. Hire the right person fast. 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in that interface within one day. That fast. It's, it works so well. We've used it, and I recommend it. And look at these million other companies, some of the biggest companies in the world who've used ZipRecruiter. No more juggling emails, no more calls to your office. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidate fast in any profession, anywhere in the country. And, of course, Tech people, it's a great way to reach them, the IT professionals. Take your company to the next level today with more than 300 applications delivered. ZipRecruiter, they know how to do it. Find out why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of every size to find the most qualified candidates with immediate results. And you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter right now for free when you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support. <sighs> Equifax. Oh. I just all I can do is shake my head. So first of all, we people spend so much time. We spend so much time talking about privacy and how Google knows everything and Facebook knows everything. At least with Google and Facebook, you're you know what you're giving them this information and you know what they're doing with it. 
But who knew there were three, actually four, I found out now there's a fourth company in this country whose sole job it is is to collect every possible bit of information about you and you and you and all of us and then sell it to other companies. That's what the credit reporting agencies do. Equifax is just one of them. There's TransUnion, Experian, um, Equifax, TransUnion. Oh, and this new one that I never heard of, but I found out on the on New York Times, uh, is it Anovis? <laughs> So they're, they, and I understand why we have to. It's a necessary evil because if you're going to go try to buy a car or a house or rent a car, rent a house, uh, get a job, sometimes they'll do a credit report on you even to get hired. Um, companies need to find out, are you uh, credit worthy? Are you a, a, a worthwhile risk? So that's what these agencies do. They collect all that information and then companies come to them and say, tell me all about Leo. Can I lend him money? They also have a side business, pretty lucrative side business, I'm told, selling your information to companies that want to give you free credit card offers. You ever get a free credit card offer in the mail? Well, where do they get your information from? Experian, Equifax, TransUnion. That's, that's their business. All right, I understand. Necessary evil, capitalist economy. We've got to have these guys. But <laughs> you're, if you're going to be do this kind of skeezy business, you have a very high responsibility to protect that data. That's what I didn't understand. Didn't they have, well, let me ask it this way. Do they have some type of compliance in place that they're supposed to follow the way all of our other financial institutions That's in the U.S.? That's a question. Apparently not. Equifax told us all uh, this week that 143 million customer records had been stolen by hackers uh, I bet you that number's low. I bet you that number goes up over time. We've seen that before. Apparently, this is this. I love this. This is Dan <laughs> Gooden's great image. Yeah, Dan Gooden's <laughs> article in Ars Technica with a guy trying to stem the flow from a pipe, mm -hmm. not very effectively. Uh, apparently, they Equifax knew about it July 29th. Shortly thereafter, three Equifax employees, including their chief financial officer, sold stock worth millions of dollars. And uh, then they revealed it publicly, and of course the stock price tumbled. I think that sounds like insider trading. Equifax said, oh no, those guys didn't know. <laughs> Your CFO, really? Your CFO did not know? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm sure the SEC will have something to say about that later. Uh, five weeks they knew about this. They didn't tell us. R right there, that's a problem because the minute that stuff goes out into the dark net, and is being traded by hackers, you're at risk. We're all at risk. Mother's maiden name, social security number. In some cases, right. credit card numbers, phone numbers, addresses. Equifax has not been very upfront about what information was leaked, how this information was retrieved, why it took them so long to respond. They really haven't said much at all. In fact, the only thing Equifax did is set up a website, which I'm not going to give you because you shouldn't go there, <laughs> that you can enter in the last six... There's only nine in your social security number. Last six digits. No, there's 10, right? All but the th first three digits of your social and your last name. And then they would say, oh, you were affected or no, you weren't. Except that Brian Krebs entered a random number and Donald Trump's name. And it said, oh, yeah, you've been affected. It's random, apparently. It do either it doesn't work or it has nothing to do with anything. And then they immediately send you to a site where they offer you a year of free credit monitoring a year How which will, I'm that? well, I'm sure in a year <laughs> and, and a day, they're going to say, and by the way, if that's thirty nine ninety five from now on, and they'll, they're trying to make money on this. That's so sleazy. Also, they, 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 Who, they asked people to agree to terms of service, right? Didn't they? That well, this is, okay, so this is a little questionable. Service, Equifax yeah. said, no, we, it, we, this doesn't apply to the breach. This only applies to this new trusted ID service. However, they said in the if you sign up for Trusted ID, which you should not, absolutely should not do, you should not give in the right. last six of your social, you shouldn't have anything to do with Equifax at all if you can help it. Uh, uh, what they what they said is, well, uh, you can't sue us. You can only there's no you can't have a class action lawsuit against us. It's only arbitration. But I think a experts agree that's not binding. You can still sue the hell out of them and should. And yeah. B, it doesn't. Equifax says it doesn't apply to the breach. It only applies to trusted ID. Don't deal with Equifax. Don't make any agreements yeah. at all with Equifax, period. A great example of just how a company, even still, I mean, it seems like 
when are we going to get to the point where companies of this size understand how to deal with stuff like this? I think we're still, it still feels like we're in the days where I, I can't remember a large company that's been affected and so many of them have that nailed their response to this <laughs> kind of thing, right? And I think the other thing that's scary to me is the like over time, there's a profile that gets built up about each individual user depending on different hacks that happen, right? Maybe there's a, a part of your profile gets stolen over here and it's just your mother's maiden name and your telephone number and then another hack over here gets your social security number. And eventually there's there's an incremental thing that's happening here to users all over the place that I think is really scary. And at the same time, so many users are becoming less and less they're becoming desensitized to these stories because it seems like there's one every month. Um, and I think both of those it's things like, every freak week. me out. Yeah, yeah. Both of those things freak me out. Well, I, and, I, just, and I, I don't think it's a it's a state secret how to secure data. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, but I think that we know how to do this. Have you ever heard of a breach of your data from Google or Facebook? Yeah. I, I feel like we know how to encrypt data, how to secure it. We don't know how the hackers got in. The st one of the stories I saw said that Equifax said they got in through their website, which is a v which bodes very poorly. This That's special scary. site they set up uh, has security flaws of its own. In the JavaScript is the login name for the site. I mean, th th these guys are obviously inept. They. I agree with you, Ant. There should be there should be some some require some federal requirements for privacy and security for these companies. But what, what? maybe one of the reasons they haven't is that Equifax, along with all the others, is a big contributor to Republican congressmen, to lawmakers. They've since the creation of the um, CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Equifax is. Uh, donated more than half a million dollars in campaign cash trying to get Republicans to put the CFPB out of business. The CFPB was created after the, you know, the deplorable uh, financial crisis of 2008 to protect Americans, to force disclosures. Uh, they, Equifax has been lobbying, for instance, to repeal the rule that um, requires them to be suable. They uh, they want to repeal the the agency entirely. The FTC has been on this too, right? I mean, the FTC has been is has been trying. I think you know I, I've interviewed a few times uh, chair former chairwoman Edith Ramirez, um, and you know I think that the FTC has been has been trying to force change about this for a long time. They've been talking about data privacy for a long time, and. And the problem is, just like the FCC in the net neutrality de debate, this uh, this stuff is really hard to do through the agency. Um, it needs to happen through an act of Congress, quite literally, and for reasons that you're describing, Leo. Congress um, is in the back pockets of companies like Equifax. Look at this bill, yeah. H.R. 2359. Barry Loudermilk of uh, Georgia introduced this May 4th. The... Uh, to amend civil liability requirements under the Fair Credit Reporting Act to limit class action lawsuit payments to five hundred thousand dollars with no punitive uh, uh, amounts. I mean, this is this is clearly something written by companies like Equifax and put through with their tame members of Congress to protect them against this kind of event. By the way, good news, there's a massive class action lawsuit that's been filed against uh, Equifax. I think, was it $70 billion? Uh, I have to, if members of Congress, of course, have asked them to come in and testify. I just don't feel like Equifax has did the right thing in the first place protecting us, has done the right thing in the, in the res response to it, and is being forthright in any way about uh, what, what information was leaked. Yeah, who who does who does Equifax answer to with with regards to this? And secondly, why did they wait so long to to release the information? And I know you have to have some type of investigation before you tell the press, uh, you know, we had a breach because you want all of the facts to be there. But it took them a month to get the facts straight. Yeah, it's more than a month. Also, 
Also, if my security is breached, I want to be notified. Yes. I don't want to have to go to a website and ask no. and then you know, exactly. sign away rights. Somebody's saying this isn't the first time. This is the third time Equifax has been hacked. So uh, I they just, surely just, have no problem calling you to offer you a bunch of things you don't want. You can <laughs> robo dial me and say, hey, you, you've been hacked, you know, something. You have my number, Equifax. <laughs> you have, you exactly. have my well, number. They do. They do. They do that. Yeah. They were hacked in 2015. Um, I just it just feels like um, it feels like there's no accountability at all. Unbelievable. In 2015, 15 million. Oh no, this was an X. This was an Equifax. This was Experian. In 2015, Experian was hacked. 15 million cu customer records uh, were exfiltrated. 143 million, pretty much as every adult in the U.S. <laughs> as close as could be, which tells me that. Um, they lost the entire database, right? So why are they saying, oh, don't worry, only 222,000 people lost their the credit cards numbers were lost? I want to know a little bit more about that. They probably in some ways, too, your credit either. card. Yeah. I'm in sorry. Some ways too, your, in some ways, too, your credit card number is, in some ways, like the least valuable part. Right. At least to me, like, I can call my credit card company yeah, you get a new and say, one of those. these charges are BS. Yeah, good give, luck getting a new, new social. Car. That's, right, that's exactly. fun. Exactly. So uh, there's a couple of ways you can really s s sock it to them. <laughs> uh, my suggestion is uh, you can you can do a fraud, put a fraud alert on your uh, uh, account that you have to renew every few months. Rules vary state to state on this, but uh, that you uh, usually have to renew every three months. And that means they have to notify you when anybody pulls a credit report on you. Even better, credit freeze in some states, you have to pay for this as much as $10 to freeze your credit per reporting company. So that'd be $30 for the big three. And then to unfreeze it, and what you need to do if you want to get a loan, is another $10 each. So it's not cheap. Although, again, in some states, it's free. It depends on how the, how the state legislature uh, ruled on this. But uh, a credit freeze means they can't use your, can't give anybody your credit information and would completely eliminate their ability to make money, which is why they make this a very hard thing to do. But it might be worthwhile. Um, well, I, I, you know, if you go to the state of California, it has a, a great page on credit freezing and, and, and uh, fraud alerts, and they have links to all three to the, the credit freeze pages. You should be aware, though, that if you're going to get a credit freeze, the way you get it is by giving them all your information because they don't mm -hmm. they have to know it's you, right? Right. So, yeah. New York Times says three hacks of Equifax were disclosed by Equifax this year. Yeah, I I, I don't I don't even know where to begin. It's just uh, it's appalling. It, it's so as it's bad like, as you, you can know, get. You used to rob banks because that's where the money is. You rob Equifax because that's where the social security yeah. numbers are. Data is better than money nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, when I'm not doing any content creation, I'm writing SQL. And I think about all the data that I see during the day and just how valuable that is. It's way more valuable than me walking out there and finding somebody's, you know, wallet with a few bucks in it. You know, I have all of this private information that could lead to a bunch of other information that could, you know, bring me a wealth of money if I was that type yeah. of person, you know. Uh, that's <laughs> wow. Uh, by the way, that's a hell of a skill. If you can write SQL queries, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some Russian hackers who would love to, to offer you a job. <laughs> a job. Well, you said the website, it was, was how they got through. That was the first thing to come to my right. mind was a SQL injection. Sure. And I'm like, man, that's like the first thing you want to try to combat when you put your site up, Lord. you know? Well, why is their database even connected to their public facing website? I mean, go. I can think of a lot of things <laughs> wrong with this picture. But again, we don't know how it, we don't know. We have scant information. Mm. <sighs> All right. I, I'm, I, that, my blood pressure is going to go through the roof. Let's take a quick break. I'm going <laughs> to breathe, Leo. Aunt Pruitt is here from Tech Republic. He knows SQL. Watch out. He's, he could be trouble. Uh, also here from Codebreaker. Great to have Ben Johnson. And from uh, PED30, Philip Elmer DeWitt, the dean. I don't know SQL. You don't know SQL? <laughs> no. Oh, it's easy peasy. I know my SQL. 
That's kind of like the same as a, a sequel query, right? It's similar, right? <laughs> similar. <laughs> Little Tommy drop tables. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen that XKCD comic, I'm sure. I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why did you name your kid Little Tommy drop tables? <laughs> <laughs> Sanitize your inputs, kids. That's our message of the day. Our show today brought to you by Fresh Books. The ridiculously easy-to-use cloud accounting software. If you are a, uh, a, a freelancer, if you are a small business, if you're an entrepreneur, you know that you know you got in business for one thing because something something you love, photography or uh, plumbing or SQL queries. You didn't get into business because you love sending invoices. That's the worst part of business is billing. You know you don't like paying bills, right? Who likes sending bills? It's just as bad. It's paperwork. Let FreshBooks do it. I did when I first uh, found out about FreshBooks. It's been more than 10 years now. They had just started, and I was going to Canada once a week, once a month to uh, do a TV show, and I had to invoice Rogers for my time and for my travel expenses. It was just a pain in the butt. You know, fire up Excel. You got to find all the receipts. Put it, it was just a pain in the butt. And it was actually my co-host, Amber MacArthur, who said, oh, there's this new company in Toronto. You're going to love them, FreshBooks. It made it really easy. All of a sudden, invoicing was a snap. And I noticed I got paid faster. Of course, you know, first thing you learn is if you don't send an invoice, you don't get paid at all. That, that's, that's kind of fundamental. <laughs> Sounds like that adds up. Yeah, that does. <laughs> don't tell anybody. I went six months because I just hated it so much. And I didn't send it. And then I sent six months with the invoices. And I got yelled at by the bookkeeper at Rogers. She said, you can't do that. We don't, <laughs> you, next time you do that, we're not going to pay you. You need to bill us every month. Okay, okay, okay. Uh it turns out if you use FreshBooks, you get paid on average 11 days faster. Your invoices look pro. They're easier for them, too, because there is a button on the email, on the invoice that says, pay Leo. Well, in your case, it'll say your name. Pay pay, pay this bill, and they makes it easy for them. They can use all the online payment systems. You can set automatic payment reminders, automatic late fees. You can set up recurring invoices. You can even, if, you're, if your customer agrees, set up automatic payments. So the whole thing can be friction-free. And then it turns out that because they're doing the invoicing, by the way, expenses are really easy too. You just take a picture of the receipt. It goes right in the invoice. You can keep track of time and hours. The uh, the website or the app, they're great FreshBooks apps, uh, will, will do that for you automatically. Again, put it right into the invoice. But what's great about this is in, in the process of collecting your expenses and your accounts receivable and all of that, They've done your accounting. So you can go to your new this new FreshBooks dashboard will tell you everything about your business. Like how many how many freelancers know if they've they've made a profit so far this year? Usually you don't know whether you made money until tax time. Well now you'll know exactly where you stand at any moment. Uh, it's so simple, it's so slick, it's so easy to use. I want you to try it absolutely free for 30 days. You get the entire FreshBooks deal free at freshbooks.com slash twit. Uh, you can see receipt attachments from your view invoices in the iOS app. You can log in. On, they always are adding features, which I really like. Every Because it's you know it's an online uh, uh, website plus the app, they're constantly adding new features. Employees can now log in on the FreshBooks mobile app for iOS, which makes it easier for them to, to take care of business. So if you have employees, you can bill for time by client, by projects. You can assign services to projects, have different rates for each service. Very flexible. It's for, FreshBooks was included in the Forbes Small Giants list for 2017. A huge honor. And I want you to try it free for 30 days. FreshBooks.com slash twit. All I ask is uh, when you fill out that form and they say, how did you hear about us? You just say, hey, I heard about it on twit. FreshBooks.com slash twit. It'll, I'm, it was a lifesaver for me. It'll be a lifesaver for you. FreshBooks.com slash twit. This week in tech... On the air, let's see. Uh, sad news. I am a big HTC fan. Remember the HTC One? That was a that was like the best with the front facing speakers, solid Boom aluminum sound. body. Boom sound, right? Um, HTC has had its worst quarter, I think, in thirteen years, and now the rumor is Google may be buying HTC's smartphone division. You mentioned the Vive ad. That's a great. A VR headset, and I imagine they'll still be around, but the mobile division uh, may be moving to Google, which would be interesting. Remember Google? I had assumed. 
I had assumed HCC would double down on the Vive because it, it was that's that's their growth. It thing. was so great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, again, I get sick just at the drop of a hat because of my ears, but I did the Vive experience and it just blew me away. And I didn't get any type of nausea or anything like that, but just the the technology behind it and having those controllers and all of that to interface with it, it was it was just great. I, I agree. Um, and big the the, the the partnership with Steam is really important too, because then you can get all mm -hmm. the Steam apps. And I, uh, the Vive is fantastic. I'm, I love it. But the smartphone business—they've really struggled. And I have to say, they might have deserved it. The last few, they had the one, and they kind of went downhill after that. And the last few phones I've used of HTC is very unimpressive. Not great. Yeah. yeah. The rumor is they are making the the small Pixel Two. LG will make the big Pixel Two. I don't. It's not enough to save the company, and maybe that would be why uh, Google would be interested in buying them. They did remember they bought Motorola, and that did not work out well. Google. Yeah, I don't get. I don't get. I like. Uh, forgive me, but I don't. I don't understand. I actually don't understand why the Google possibility here because yeah. didn't haven't, haven't we they learned heard, anything? Done this? Yeah, haven't we <laughs> seen this before with Motorola? Yeah, they they bought Motorola uh, in 2012 for 12 and a half billion dollars, sold it to Lenovo 3 years later or 2 years later for 3 billion dollars. But they yeah. kept the IP. They kept the intellectual property. There were right. there were a lot of patents. There were thousands okay. of so patents. So some of it had a bunch needed. of patents, okay. Motorola patents. So some of the value. But even right. still what, what why what's the interest in HTC like what what how does this make sense in a way that the that well, are they getting a bunch of IP here's what's like, changed what, remember in 2012 Google was making the Nexus phones and they weren't making they were as they do today they were getting other companies to make them and brand right. them uh, those were inexpensive phones that really looked like they were a developer platform like uh, you know this is the this is the reference platform for Android we don't expect anybody to really use it. But then the Pixel phones come along, and it really looks like Google has ambitions to be a flagship phone manufacturer. But they're not making them still. So uh, who made the who made the the original Pixels? I forget. Um, but it wasn't made by Google. It was made to Google's specifications. So it would make oh, sense. The original Nexus. Um, well, the Nexus was made by a bunch of people. In fact, HTC. Yeah. HTC had one. Made, made one of them. Made the first one, I think. Uh, Samsung made some. The um, Nexus One, I think, was a Samsung phone. But I can't remember who made these pixels. But anyway, it would make sense for Google if they say, well, we, we're going to now make a business out of Android devices. And they could reasonably do so. Because as you pointed out, uh, these are... these are Huawei. That's the name. Huawei. Yeah. Huawei. Thank you, <laughs> Burke in the chat room, and Aunt, I, hey, yeah, congratulations for going to the chat room. Most people are not brave enough to 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 go into the chat room during the show. You're a, you're a brave fellow, but they haven't said anything bad about you, so that's or good. ignorant, or <laughs> brave or ignorant, one or the other. So uh, no, the chat room's fine. They're not going to bite you. Uh, I could I could kind of see if this is an okay. Now it's a business for Google. Maybe we should own a manufacturer. I don't know. You know, I have, have a, a go ahead, Dan. I have a story about HTC, and it goes back to how I first started getting into content creation. Your friend Gina Smith yeah. gave me my first opportunity. No kidding, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Gina Smith and Doctor Doctor Purnell was part of. The I was going to say that was a new domain, right? And Jerry wrote yes, for sir. a new domain. I didn't. So you worked with Jerry and yes, Gina, sir. yeah. And at the time, there was a time where. Um, HTC was reaching out to Gina and all of us for content creation for a blog that they were trying to market towards millennials. And right before we, we had that um, relationship put together, I had a piece published talking about HTC sort of losing its way with the with the <laughs> smartphone, you know, and so it was a little awkward. Nice one, Ed. Nice meeting. one, Ed. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> A little awkward in that meeting, but at the same time, I was I was right, you know, and they were pretty candid about it and spoke with me as far as what, what, what my opinions were. And they made great hardware for that time, but it just wasn't elevating or incrementing as fast as you everybody were warning, else. Was you saying. were warning them rightly so. 
And I bet you this is right around the M1 came out and the Zoe's. This was right after the Zoe's and um, that little re camera thing. That they yeah. Had. Oh, I had a re. I loved that re. The re was fine. It streamed right to YouTube. The re was fine. And it's been straight downhill ever point. since. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were right. And they, I guess they appreciated your honesty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I can't, it makes me sad because I really feel like HTC. They had a design language. They had, a, they had made, they did make quality stuff. And they just lost their way in some, some strange. You know, I way. give them credit for trying things yeah. just to to see what happens. You know, with this latest phone, the squeeze technology, um, you know, to activate the camera and things like that. That's that's something different. And Supposedly, that's going to be part of the new Pixel, Pixel Two. Uh, Google's going to use the squeeze to launch the Google Assistant, which might work. That would be a nightmare. That would be a nightmare for uh, me. I, can't I, already, launched, that, I already launched. I already launched Google, <laughs> are, Google are Assistant you, by mistake are, all the are time. Are you one of those tense so. people that's always like, you need to get a little squeeze ball? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I I don't know why, but I just I I like I I already like inadvertently get Google Assistant going. I don't even know how it happens. I'm yeah, not saying no, okay, I Google. I trigger it all. I trigger it. Yeah. Echo, so. Google, Siri, they all get triggered in my house. I can't watch yeah. TV without bloop, bloop, what, huh? Bloop, bloop, all <laughs> the time. My audio books do that as I'm driving. Yeah, drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just the way it is. Get ready. That's life in the future. The future. Yeah. In the yeah. future, everything <laughs> answers everything. RF guy in the chat room uh, is mentioning that HTC told him they didn't get the support from the chip companies, probably Qualcomm, oh. uh, maybe... Uh, Samsung, so they weren't able to get the chips that the biggies, big guys who could negotiate, and that that happens, right? It's 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 kind of like uh, speaking of chips, poker. When you are the chip leader in poker, you have a huge advantage just because you're big. When Holy. you're the when you're selling eighty million phones, you have a huge advantage, and it just kind of it's a vicious circle. The big, the rich get richer, and the little companies kind of fade away. And I yeah. think HTC, uh, that's just what's happening to them. Yeah. Apple famously buys up full, you know, the capacity of something that they need. That's kind of a a, a pressure point. Uh, they'll buy up all the capacity and really squeeze everybody else. I, I got to say, I feel bad for the Android uh, phone makers because uh, because they they all use the same operating system. They they end up competing on price. Uh, which is a race to the bottom, uh, and there's, yeah. you know, there, there's a reason that Apple, you know, it's got what 16% of the global market, but it takes home 85, 90% of the profit in cell phones. Uh, right. th so they're all struggling, and I'm not surprised that Motorola gets sold in H to H in, you know, and and they end up with Google that's got the money to to yeah. to, to keep them alive. It's going to be Apple, Samsung. Huawei's still huge because they have the China market. Um, the the Chinese manufacturers, uh, because they have a huge market to play in, and there's a lot of cost advantages to to working in that. Uh, you know, where all the all the suppliers are all in the same place. Uh, they can they're competing very well with the with Samsung and Apple. They're beating Apple and Samsung in China, and that's enough to make a a, a living. That's that's good market. Yeah, yeah. Well, they got a market of what a billion consumers. That's all it yeah. takes. You sell a few phones. They uh, haven't been uh, as good as bringing it uh, out. Bring you know they're not selling as well outside. Outside now. The it, it's bad for consumers though because as uh, it's a consolidate it's inevitable it's kind of it's capitalism right you get consolidation and a few big companies end up dominating but it's, we just don't get the innovation and the choice uh, that we deserve and at some point nobody has headphone jacks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's the eventuality right no that's what happens jacks it's, yeah it's, yeah. it's devolution yeah and it, it's weird too that I, I you know the headphone jack the no headphone jack thing i think is interesting to me because the the effort there is to make it thinner right um uh and i just i i don't know do our do, does the phone really need to get that much thinner that we lose the headphone jack or battery life? That's another thing that's for sacrificing, right? Right. For someone and, with really large hands, I need my phone to be substantial. Yeah. And these yeah. The, the whole trend of going 
smaller and thinner just just bugged me at one point in time. And I'm glad that we have these, you know, five and a half, five point seven inch uh, devices nowadays versus the older ones, you know. The most boring, most important innovation in smartphones, I think, that we're still waiting for is a legitimate battery life like <laughs> that. You know, I, if you give me a I will pay Apple prices, I will pay for two iPhones if you tell me my battery will last a week. Oh, and charge good luck. in 10 minutes. Oh, Free you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no technology <laughs> exists that will do that. <laughs> Dream on. You can't hey, even get can I, my wristwatch phone, doesn't last 12 hours. Clear phone, you know? Yeah, clear. If they can make it clear, make it last a week. Somebody get Elon Musk on the line. Yeah. Let's get this in. There. It'll be it'll have a little nuclear <laughs> reactor in it or something like that. <laughs> so ever since uh, November, Facebook's been denying that Russians bought political ads on Facebook. On Wednesday, they admitted it. More than $100,000 worth of ads on hot-button social issues targeting voters. Uh, many of the ads didn't refer to political candidates, but the purchases, we're starting to learn, were aimed at people who were Clinton voters. Facebook officials says that it, these ads were purchased by a multitude of fake accounts created by the Internet Research Agency, which is a well-known uh, kind of troll factory out of the, uh, Russia. I almost said the Soviet Union. It kind of feels like it, doesn't it? It's a far part of their very broad disinformation uh, efforts. It does really raise the issue. Uh, you know, Facebook... After the election, said, oh, "We didn't." Mark's like, "We didn't have anything to do with that." Mark said, oh, "No, you know, uh, we." But I think we're learning more and more that Facebook wields immense power because of its ad platform, because of its vast usership uh, in the United States and around the world. And this is concerning. It is uh, now. We talked about this on Wednesday and this week in Google, and uh, we thought at the time that it wasn't illegal. But I do believe now, having looked into it, that it is illegal for a foreign government to try to influence elections by buying ads. That's not legal. So Facebook uh, did violate federal law by selling those ads. They probably didn't know. Uh, they say Facebook is cooperating now with members of Congress. Staff members briefed uh, Senate and House Intelligence Committees on Wednesday. Um, Facebook's also cooperating with Robert Mueller, the special counsel. They wrote, we have shared our findings with U.S. authorities investigating these issues. We'll continue to work with them as necessary. What is Facebook's responsibility? And did they know all along that they, why didn't they only now find out that these ads were sold to Russian Mark, entities? I, I wonder when they, when you do Facebook ads, uh, what's the process? You, you go on, you, you open up your account or whatever, and you, you sign in to say, I want to purchase some ads. What are the questions that are being asked from the Facebook form uh, to give you access to have ad placement on there. You know, Dale Coco, I, know, I believe, is in the chat. He said, you know, they shouldn't have any, any, anyone doing ads for political reasons. But does Facebook even know when someone signs up? I mean, I could just go in there and say, I want to do Aunt Pruitt ads. And they probably don't even care what the ads are. It just says Aunt Pruitt. I, I don't know. Anybody ever done this? No, there, there is. a. They, they, they ask you how much you want to spend. You submit the ad and then they have to approve it. Um, and I don't know what their criterion on, but but there is a step where some algorithm or some human approves the ad because uh, okay. you can't just put anything. I up. think it's humans. Um, I think it's humans. And I but but I will also say that I've done this and it does not take long. Yeah. For it to get so approved. they're not it's, looking it's, it's real, real hard. Fast. Yeah. 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 What, what's in so. what what really for for someone who spends more time watching the White House good circle the drain than, than following <laughs> Apple these days. Um, what's interesting about the Facebook thing is that we've known that the Russians hacked uh, Podesta's emails and, and got all this anti-Hillary stuff. Well, what we don't know is how they knew to direct it to the right precincts uh, and uh, to weaponize it is the jargon they use. And uh, one of the the theories is, and, and what Mueller is trying to find out, is did the uh, Trump uh, campaign operation, which had great research, uh, feed it to the Russians and help them weaponize the thing? That they did. They knew uh, what, a lot, what precincts. Uh, 
they needed to sway. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, now, who the, knows what better? The Facebook, the Facebook thing uh, is not dispositive because it's pretty easy uh, for someone who doesn't know much about U.S. politics to, to guess at where to send stuff. You know, you, you know that probably, you know, you know which states are, I, I don't know. It, it just, it's, it's fairly easy to target with Facebook's tools and it may not require the sophistication of a Steve Bannon right. to know exactly where to send those things. We don't know yet. New York Times has an interesting article about the, these, this kind of Russian troll uh, farm. Uh, and an example, Melvin Reddick of Harrisburg, PA, a friendly-looking American with a backward baseball cap and a young daughter, you can see it in his profile picture, posted, uh, these guys show hidden truth about Hillary Clinton, George Soros, and other leaders of the U.S., and a link to a dcleaks.com. But there is no Melvin Reddick. In, he is a made-up character by Russian hackers. And this was... The problem is, and I can understand, Facebook... Look, there, people have posed as me on Facebook. And it took me going to Facebook saying, that's not me, to get it down. Uh, they've got a billion and a half users. This is a very yeah, it's difficult... It's hard to filter a billion yeah. records, you know? Yeah, yeah. Facebook is reactive, uh, you know, when it comes to this kind of thing. And I think that's, to me, that's been over the time, over time covering this stuff, um, whether it's people impersonating other people. They have a big problem with this in India, for instance, of, of um, you know, uh, folks impersonating uh, other people uh, to get Facebook accounts and then say bad things about them. This is like a, a you know, I've, I've talked to some people who are dealing with this. I think... Facebook at, at a basic level is reactive, um, whether that's um, w whatever it is that violates their I terms and conditions, necessary. whether it's violent video. What are you going to yeah. do, right? I think that's necessary. I don't. I don't know how they can be proactive. I guess I don't. I don't either. But I think that's what what we're seeing to a certain degree is 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 because of that yeah. is because Facebook, um, you know, can't, can't be proactive about right. it maybe. Right. Um, right. and, and that's why we see this stuff after, after the fact, um, you know, and at this point in the New York times story about, you know, the, the company said it also found another two, 2,200 ads, um, that were, you know, bought, uh, in America and were sort of more vaguely, related to politics than the more direct advertising stuff. And they hadn't really figured out yet whether or not those were part of this larger effort. Right. You know, they're just, I think they're trying to figure it out. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's normal, but that's part of what we're seeing. Yeah, right. They do. Yeah. Let's take a break. One more uh, segment to go. Kind of the, the stories that filtered to the bottom of the of the rundown this week, Aunt Pruitt is here from Tech Republic, from Codebreaker the podcast. Is it Codebreaker dot com, Ben Johnson? Codebreaker dot codes. Dot, that is the show, dot and codes. and also, yeah. And I leaked. You know, I should I should have said before I leaked to you. We were talking about leaks. I leaked to you what I'm doing next when I saw you. So you know, I, I it's uh, it, it, you've gotten the leak. It's I just want it's you to know really that. safe to leak to me because I have a brain like a sieve. <laughs> <laughs> Although I make a point of never signing NDAs, embargoes, I don't agree not to reveal information because not only do I forget stuff, but I forget that I agreed not to say stuff, and I'm talking <laughs> all the time. So. You can't. You trust made no me. promises to me. I, I make no that. promise, you know? <laughs> but you're in luck because I remember nothing. I was drinking uh, Leo, uh, Podcaster's Punch at the time, was I not? Uh, I was too, I think. I think we were both. <laughs> the hotel deep made into a, punch. a special punch for podcasters. <laughs> Leo, in, in the chat room, Old Army says uh, that two, four, two more feet of water and Irma will be in the house and he'll have to leave the program. Old so Army. Hurry up, please. Old Army, I am so sorry. Oh. And, and, and by the way, I haven't said anything about Irma. Uh, you know, God, right on the heels of Harvey in Texas, now this in Florida. And I know we have a great many listeners in both areas. We have a great many listeners in the Caribbean islands, in the in the Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands. Uh, I, the only place we don't have listeners is Cuba. But everywhere else, uh, please, I hope you're safe. And if and our, our thoughts and prayers are with you. And Old Army, stay safe. 
I hope you have a ladder up to the roof. <laughs> Yikes. That's go, terrifying. Go on the roof. It's not, not in yeah, the attic. Not, yeah, on the roof. Yeah. Codebreaker.codes yeah. yes. if you want yes, to sir. listen to pen, pen. Ben's great podcast. Or it could be Penn's great pod podcast. I don't know. It could be any, any Penn's great podcast. podcast yeah. And what do you talk about on here? Um, we, you know, we talk about a lot of different stuff. I pitch it as, um, I pitch it as uh, uh, the Twilight Zone meets radio journalism. Love it. So, um, you know, if you've seen Black Mirror, if you've seen Mr. Robot, nice. Nice. Um, this is the kind of stuff we 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 take a kind of a, a dark edged look at technology. Um, at least the first season, we asked the fundamental question about different kinds of technology. The question was, is it evil? Um, we covered everything from email killing our productivity to internet porn to actually data um uh, data selling which we've been talking about today in the second season uh, the question was can it save us and we talk about everything from sort of climate change based technology uh, or technology rooted in solving climate change issues uh to uh virtual reality augmented reality and uh and technology that are helping refugees um in the refugee crisis in syria things like that fascinating so, and you do this yeah. really cool thing, which is you can listen to next week's podcast if you crack the code. Yeah, we make it bingeable uh, like a Netflix show uh, when we release each season by hiding a secret code in every episode. So clever. Uh, so, yeah, it's fun. It's I fun, love that yeah. idea. That's really yeah, good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Codebreaker.codes. Is that yes, right? Sir. C O D E S? Yep. I yes, didn't even sir. know yep. there was a codes DLN, a uh, TDL. Yeah. That's we got one. Wow. Codes. <laughs> I like it. Also, uh, of course, the legendary Philip Elmer DeWitt, PED30.com, who will be skying to Cupertino any minute now. Get ready for the Apple event. Our show today brought to you by Tracker. The Tracker. I, I have a Tracker story. We went to a concert on Friday night, and I, I thought I lost my keys at the bar uh, next door. Or I couldn't. I was patting my pockets. I can't find my keys. So I went to the bar next door. Do you find any keys? They didn't. They, and now the good news is my keys have a, a Tracker Pixel attached. And I was looking on the Tracker, and I said, "Well, it's around here somewhere." And then I remembered. Oh yeah, I could press. I could tap the button on my phone and the alarm on the tracker will go off. I press the button. I'm in the bar. I'm thinking, oh, they're here somewhere. And then I realize, oh, they're in they're in the hidden pocket in my Scotty vest shirt. Never mind. <laughs> but even if you lose your keys in your shirt, you can find them again with the tracker. It's a coin-sized tracking device. Pairs with your phone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. You check the couch. You check the kitchen. You check the pockets. On average... All of us spend as much as 50, what is it, 50 minutes a day, according to Newsweek, searching for stuff we know we own, we know we have, we just can't find it. You look in the in the fridge. You ever look in the fridge for your glasses and stuff? Yeah, because I know I must have absentmindedly. You, you look in the peanut butter chart. Well, you don't have to look anywhere. You can use the tracker. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything with their first tracking device and they've done it again. The new Tracker Pixel is out. That's what I have on my keys. It has a, a LED all around it that will light up, makes it easy to find stuff that's, you know, fallen under the bed or whatever. It's the lightest Bluetooth tracking device in the market. But even though it's light, it still has a replaceable battery. I love them for that because unlike other trackers, when the tracker battery dies after a year, you can replace it, not throw it away. I put trackers on everything, in, in my keys, on my briefcase, in my car, in my luggage, on my bike. I don't want to lose anything. You can pair up to 10 trackers to your smartphone. You can share with other people's smartphones. You can have family, family find things time. You get a 90 decibel alert. That's what I got that helped me find my tracker. Uh, if, you, if you lose your phone, you press the button on the tracker and your phone rings, even if it's silenced. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because Tracker has the best crowd locate network in the world with more than 5 million trackers out there. Anytime, just if you want to play with it, if you've got a tracker, turn on the notifications. And anytime somebody walks by that's running the software, you'll get a notification. Oh, I just saw your device. I just saw your device. It's a mind boggling because there are people everywhere with tracker software. It's so fantastic. Look at the dots on the map. 
You'll never lose anything again. Go to the tracker.com and the promo code TWIT. You'll save 20% on any order. Pick up the Tracker Bravo, the Tracker Pixel. Get a few extra accessories. You can put it on your pet. They have a special waterproof case you can put it in. It's awesome. The Tracker, T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R, the tracker.com. Use the promo code TWIT and save 20% from the Tracker. All right, well, we're going to wrap things up here. You guys have been working hard. I think somebody's dying of a cough. Was that you, Ann? Are you okay? Oh, no, it's fine. me. It's me. <laughs> it was you? All right. Well, yeah, it's me. All right. Did you get how, some whiskey? That's what's saving Ant's voice. <laughs> what is it? What, what, Ant? How large are those trackers? I've been considering it I don't know. for I, my I've, uh, I've drone. I guess I've, they're about the size of a poker chip. I've lost mine. <laughs> no, no. It's in my... <laughs> 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 yeah, I know exactly what it is. It's in my yeah, tracker for um, tracker. <laughs> there's a, the Tracker Bravo is, is a anodized aluminum, very light to be appropriate for a drone. It's the size of a quarter, but the, the pixel's even smaller and lighter. And and so it's, it's the size of a button almost. I mean, a little bigger, but it's very small. And it'll be perfect for... I, in fact, did put one on my drone. I did I like everything. I put the FAA registration number. I put my phone number. I thought... Of, I Because I, I, I know I'm going to lose this sucker someday. I like the idea of having something audible like that because yes. I've crashed a few times and the GPS does a decent job of getting me close to where the thing went down. Yeah. But I like that audible feedback would, would be really nice. Yes. It, it's, I've lost my drone in the grass and, uh, and I know it's here somewhere. <laughs> All right. And if it was making right. the noise, here we go. Here's, so this is the uh, tracker pixel. It's not very big. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's my size of that. a dime. Nah, maybe a nickel. How? How long does the battery last? That's, that depends. That's so uh, it's Bluetooth LE, so it's low energy. So it can last as long as a year. But I turn on all the two-way separation stuff. So like if you leave your keys behind, your phone honks. If you leave your phone behind, your keys honk. And that uses up more juice. But the thing is, it's just one of those CR... Uh, like this one, I think, is a CR2030 battery. I've got a dozen of them. So maybe oh, yeah. every three to six months, I'll replace it. Oh, you can replace it. Can you batteries? attach it to your cat? Can yes, you, put you it on can. This is okay, good. fine for a cat. <laughs> okay, good. Safe for a cat. That's all I Safe need. Safe for right. your cat. I'm sad to say uh, silently and without uh, notice, without fanfare, Oracle laid off its entire Solaris tech staff uh, oh. last week. Really the end of life of Solaris and the last, pretty much the last of uh, Sun's products uh, at Oracle. Oracle really bought... Sun for one reason only. They wanted the Java, Java. Uh, rights so they could sue Google for billions. That was it. <laughs> that was the real reason. I don't, you know, I don't, I guess it's important to mention it because Solaris was so, but I don't think it may have had a huge impact these days. Um, Amazon's looking for a second headquarters. And this is a bonanza for somebody. It will invest $5 billion plus hire 50,000 employees. So they've gone around the country asking uh, cities to bid for HQ2. And you can bet a lot of cities are into it, into it and interested. Uh, Amazon awesome. told Seattle they're going to have 12 million square feet by 2022. It pretty much owns downtown Seattle. Eight, more than eight million square feet with 33 billion. I'm sorry, 33 buildings. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, there was a, a, a really interesting graphic in the, I think it was the Times, where they said, forget it, Amazon, we'll tell you exactly where you should go. And they narrowed it down to Denver. I'm sure Denver was happy to hear that. I would like Amazon to move to uh, Petaluma. You have uh, instant access to the Twit network. <laughs> Power hardly ever goes out. We haven't had a hurricane in years, and it never snows. They're, right. they're trolling for tax breaks, Leo. Leo oh, you got something I, to give them? I can't help them with tax breaks. You're right, of course. <laughs> it's all about the tax breaks, isn't it? That was my was first thought. I was thinking like about GE going to Boston, and I was like, and and then there was the what is that Foxconn? That Foxconn deal? Oh yeah, they're in Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, yeah. in Wisconsin, yeah. whatever it is. Is it Wisconsin or like, Minnesota? I can't remember. I can't remember either. Yeah. But it, but it, I swear that you know. Uh, the tax breaks, I feel like these kinds of deals always end up not being, it's like building a new stadium or something. It's like, they're like, the jobs. And then like five years later, you're like, eh, the, the government just gave them a bunch of tax breaks and money to move to a place. And it's not actually that much better. They're, I could be wrong. Obviously. No, do the math. Foxconn's going to create 13,000 jobs in Wisconsin. 
and they're getting a $3 billion tax incentive for that. Those are expensive jobs. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a lot of money to pay for 13,000 jobs. Yeah. I figured I figured Amazon would get in the backyard of UPS, like go to Louisville somewhere because there's a it's, large yeah, airport right, right there too. Right. You know, I figured it'd be a lot more efficient. I don't think, though, they're worried about product shipping from this new headquarters. Really, it's manpower. It's personnel. It's smart people. They want somewhere where... Uh, because so the cost of living has to be fairly low. Of course, they want the tax breaks, but I think it's more office workers than uh, uh, okay. fulfillment. Yeah, they've got somebody said Detroit. Over. I thought that was kind of an interesting. I'd love to see that. Yeah, be awesome. Suggestion. Detroit could use yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Give them some life, you know. Don't yeah. use if you have a AT and T U verse. You might want to check your modem there uh, it's unclear whether Eris who makes the modem AT&T Uverse uses or AT&T introduced some horrific security flaws into these modems that allow anybody in fact I'm sure it's happening already to log into your modem literally replace the firmware with their own custom <laughs> firmware uh, complete Goodness. control of your modem there are five flaws you can SSH into the modem from anywhere because the SSH passwords are hard-coded. I can go on and on. You can run a shell. It's not a great shell. It's seashell, but I think you'll live with it, which allows you to... I mean, you just have absolute control. You run as root with a shell. Just log in. Have fun, kids. Uh, Eris and uh, AT&T, uh, I guess, will have to fix this. Eris says, we're, we're conducting an investigation, and we'll take any required actions... <laughs> Uh, does, it, does it mention who brought it to AT&T's attention? Uh, yeah. And, well, it's an interesting story. Uh, it was a company called No Motion, an analyst there named Joseph Hutchins. Normally, as you know, when security researchers find a vulnerability, they wait six months, nine, 90 days. They give the company a chance to fix it. They said right. these vulnerabilities are so severe, and Eris has such a terrible history of repairing vulnerabilities like this, they released it immediately. They said, you know what, we're going to tell everybody now because this is such a horrific threat. Uh, and we believe that bad guys already know. So we, we think the users better know right away. So that is kind of a violation of the traditional protocol for this kind of stuff. I remember I had an Ares um, device at one time and a buddy of mine, Charlie Hoover, gave me such a hard time oh, yeah. about it. I, did, I didn't know. Charlie's great. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie. Charlie, uh, he he schooled me on it. Yeah. <laughs> Ars Technica. Dan Gooden says hackers are lying in wait. They've already infiltrated infiltrated our grid, and they they've got basically an on off switch, and they're just gonna wait <laughs> until they need it. Where are the hackers from? Well, we don't know, but it's it's pretty much well thought that they're the, the same Russian guys who turned the power off in the Ukraine for a few hours just to demonstrate. Yep. Yep. That seems yep. right. Yep. 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 Nothing more to say here except I hope you have battery backup. And make grids dumber. <laughs> yeah. There may be a little too... Well, if you're going to make a grid smart, please don't connect it to the public internet. <laughs> exactly. Who thought exactly. that was a good idea? Whatever you do, don't ask Equifax what to do about it. That's the... <laughs> yeah. Ask Equifax. How do you secure your data? And uh, we'll end with this note. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Tech Dirt, Mike Masnick. Mike had the temerity to call out a guy who says, I invented email when I was a teenager in 1979. Uh, Mike said, that's not true. Uh, he was immediately sued by Shiva Ayudara. He says he, aided, he invented email in the late 70s, even though I think many of us were using email before then. Uh Tech Dirt called him a liar and a charlatan. Ayurdara sued him in uh, January 2017 for libel. On Wednesday, U.S. District Judge F. Dennis Saylor said, because it's impossible to define precisely and specifically what email is, Ayurdara's claim that he is incapable of being proven true or false. And furthermore, one person may consider a claim to be fake if any element of it is not true or if it involves a slight twisting of the facts. So there's no libel here. The case has been thrown out. We don't know if he will appeal. Uh, oh, we do know he will appeal. Here's a update to a Gooden's article. False speech is not protected by the Constitution. 
says Ayudare's attorney, Charles Harder, you may have heard his name before in context, in another context, uh, Tech Dirt's false and malicious speech about Ayodari should receive no legal protection, and we will appeal. And False uh, speech, it sounds like a lot like the people who scream fake news. Fake news, it's false speech. False speech. False speech. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Good for Tech Dirt, though. the judge did deny uh, a separate motion uh, to uh, counter sue under California's anti slap law, which allows him to recover his extensive legal fees to defend himself. So uh, Mike is out of pocket. There was, uh, you know, I don't know how much of it is his money, how much of it was from a legal defense fund. There was a legal defense fund for him. Uh, I support journalism.com. It's not too late to uh, help Mike Masnick out, even though he's won this case. The costs are huge. And, uh, and by the way, I just like to let everybody know I invented email last night <laughs> in my jammies. <laughs> and uh, if you say otherwise, you're in trouble, boy. <laughs> Fake speech. <That's> awesome. <laughs> Fake speech. Fake speech. Well, I think we've come to the end of this fabulous gripping edition of This Week in Tech. And uh, there, if, it was, if it was gripping at all, it was because of our great panel. So nice to have two new people in here. Aunt Pruitt, we're going to have you back soon. It's great to have you. Give us a plug. You, we read you on Tech Republic. Where can I find your photos and your drone work? Sure. Uh, check me out on Twitter at Ant underscore Pruitt. Um, yeah, Instagram is at, I think it's actually Ant Pruitt, no underscore. But better yet, go over to my YouTube channel and subscribe. You know, it's all about trying to create and dominate. And Clemson for life, baby. Clemson for life. <laughs> <laughs> AntPruitt.com, A N T P U. P -R, P R U I T T. Yeah, thank you. That's P R U I T T. Me. That's my Squarespace site. Ah, nice job. <laughs> it's beautiful. And a lot of pictures of uh, Clemson football, but also high school football. Your son's playing, and uh, I love it. Oh, yeah. I love it. It's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sir. It was great having you. Come back soon. Thank Same you. goes to you, Ben Johnson. Your first time on the big shoe, but I hope you will be back depending on what job you take on Monday. If you're working for the NSA, I can't promise you a seat. It's great to it's great to be here. Like I said, I've been a longtime fan of the show. I was honored to be asked. Uh, I'd love to lo love to come back if you'll have me. And of course, uh, just to, I'll just say that w what I'm doing on Monday has something to do with a website they call the front page of the internet. So Ooh. if you can work your way, you can work your way through that. Then, uh, then, then is it, is, are you going to Baston? Podcast. Are you going to Baston there? Sweet. <laughs> are you in Boston? Or where are you now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm at my parents' house, actually. Yeah. In, in Western Massachusetts. That's because you yeah. had to evacuate because of Hurricane Irma. Uh, I, I, Did your parents I, have I, that I, nice sound blanket you've got hang, hanging behind you? This um, this is going to go on their bed when this is over. <laughs> <laughs> Very honest. Great to have you, Ben. Good luck at the uh, front page of the internet. That's awesome. Codebreaker.codes yeah, for his fabulous podcast. And, of course, PED30, PED30.com is a place to go to find Philip Elmer DeWitt, who will be the first to let us know what Apple does with iPhone X. And ho hopefully have a YouTube video of, of everybody walking in. I thought you were going to stream on Facebook. Make up your mind, man. Oh, oh, face, uh, no, YouTube. 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 You're going to do yeah. YouTube Live. You're going to stream it from your phone. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. what I'm going to try to do. Awesome. I'm in Western Mass as well. Where Where are you? Oh, man, I'm in Amherst. Oh, I'm in uh, Greenfield. We're like 30 right. minutes I'll meet, away. I'm, I'll meet you in Sunderland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, the Western okay. Mass is gorgeous. That's where Tanglewood is, right? And uh, yeah, yeah my Happy grandmother. You're, you're, yeah. Think, place. you're thinking of the Berkshires. Uh, it's a little further this, west. This, a little further. Even what we farther. call Western Mass is... Uh, it's is Eastern like New York. The Connecticut Valley. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Berkshires is... Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah I, I've been and spent some time there. My grandmother had a, a house in uh, Western Mass as well. Come out, do a twit from here, man. I should. We'll be here. You know, yeah. The, yeah. the leaves are going to change any day now. That's right. We got cider donuts waiting for you. Love it. I could live on <laughs> cider and donuts. <laughs> we do This Week in Tech every Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific for us, 6 p.m. Eastern for them. Uh, that'd be 2200 UTC for the rest of you listening around the world. You can do the math. You can watch us live at twit.tv slash live or... 
Well, if you do, by the way, watch, uh, join us in the chat room, irc.twit.tv. That's a fun place to be. And every once in a while, one of our panelists will actually go in there. Brave the lion's den, as Ant did this week. Nice. <laughs> this is like this is like the most the nicest chat room, by the way, I've ever. No, they are really been a part of. They are on their best behavior. Did I say it's on yeah. Saturdays? I'm an idiot. It's, it's <laughs> Sunday, right? Okay, 3 p.m. Screensavers on Saturdays. Screen Screen thank Saturdays. you, Ant knows. <laughs> Screensavers Saturdays, Twit on Sundays. If you can't watch live because Leo's confused about the date and time, just go to the website twit.tv and download a copy. We have lots of episodes there. Search for Jerry Pornell. You can find one of the 20 episodes of Twit he appeared on. There's also two great triangulations with Jerry where he talks about his life and time. So those would be fun to listen to again. You can also get our show by subscribing. There's so many great podcast clients out there. And if you subscribe, you'll get every episode. It'll be ready for you Monday morning on your way to work. Overcast, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, Slacker, iTunes, you know. And even some great Twit apps. There are lots of great Twit apps. Subscribe and you won't miss an episode. Thanks for being here. Thanks to our studio audience. Great bunch here. If you want to be in the studio, all you have to do is email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put out a chair for you. Uh, I will see you uh, in two, uh, three weeks. I'm going to take the week off, uh, next couple of weeks off. Jason Calacanis will be our host next week, and he's put together a crazy-ass panel. I don't know. I should probably not even say, because you just I want you to be surprised. But do tune in next Sunday. And then it's uh, Becky Worley the Sunday following, right? Becky Worley is going to be my host, and I'll be back uh, September, no, October 1st on Twit. I'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks for joining us. Another Twit is in the this can. Bye bye. Amazing. Doing the Twit. Doing the Twit.